Act One of Henry the Fourth, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry the Fourth, Part One, by William Shakespeare. Act One. Scene One, London, the Palace. Enter King Henry, Lord John of Lancaster the Earl of Westmoreland, Sir Walter Blunt, and others. So shaken as we are, so wan with care, find we a time for frighted peace to pant, and breathe short-winded accents of new broils to be commenced in strands afar remote. No more the thirsty entrance of this soil shall daub her lips with her own children's blood, nor more shall trenching war channel her fields nor bruise her flowerets with the armed hoofs of hostile paces, those opposed eyes which, like the meteors of a troubled heaven, all of one nature, of one substance bred, did lately meet in the intestine shock and furious close of civil butchery, shall now, in mutual well-beseeming ranks, march all one way, and be no more opposed against acquaintance, kindred, and allies. The edge of war, like an ill-sheathed knife, no more shall cut his master. Therefore, friends, as far as to the sepulchre of Christ, whose soldier now, under whose blessed cross we are impressed and engaged to fight, forthwith the power of English shall we levy, whose arms were moulded in their mother's womb to chase these pagans in those holy fields, over whose acres walked those blessed feet which fourteen hundred years ago were nailed for our advantage on the bitter cross. But this our purpose now is twelve month old, and bootless tis to tell you we will go, therefore we meet not now. Then let me hear of you, my gentle cousin Westmoreland, what yesternight our council did decree in forwarding this dear expedience. My liege, this haste was hot in question and many limits of the charge set down but yesternight, when all athwart there came a post from Wales loaden with heavy news, whose worst was that the noble Mortimer, leading the men of Herefordshire to fight against the irregular and wild Glendower, was, by the rude hands of that Welshman, taken, a thousand of his people butchered, upon whose dead corpse there was such misuse, such beastly shameless transformation by those Welshwomen done, as may not be without much shame retold or spoken of. It seems, then, that the tidings of this broil break off our business for the Holy Land. This, matched with other, did, my gracious Lord, for more uneven and unwelcome news came from the north, and thus it did import. On Holyrood Day the gallant Hotspur there, young Harry Percy, and brave Archibald, that ever valiant and approved Scot, at home and met, where they did spend a sad and bloody hour, as by discharge of their artillery and shape of likelihood, the news was told, for he that brought them in the very heat and pride of their contention did take horse, uncertain of the issue anyway. Here is a dear, a true industrious friend, Sir Walter Blunt, newly lighted from his horse stained with the variation of each soil betwixt that Holmden and this seat of ours, and he hath brought us smooth and welcome news. The Earl of Douglas is discomfited. Ten thousand bold Scots, two and twenty knights, balked in their own blood did Sir Walter see on Holmden's plains. Of prisoners Hotspur took, Mordake the Earl of Fife, an eldest son to beaten Douglas, and the Earl of Athol of Murray, Angus, and Menteith. And is not this an honourable spoil? A gallant prize? Ha, cousin, is it not? In faith it is a conquest for a prince to boast of. Yea, there thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy, that my lord Northumberland shall be the father to so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honour's tongue, amongst a grove the very straightest plant who is sweet fortune's minion and her pride, whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonour stain the brow of my young Harry. Oh, that it could be proved that some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle-clothes our children where they lay, and called mine Percy, his Plantagenet. 
then would I have his Harry, and he mine. But let him from my thoughts. What think you, Coz, of this young Percy's pride? The prisoners, which he in this adventure hath surprised, to his own use he keeps, and sends me word. I shall have none but Mordake, Earl of Fife. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester, malevolent to you in all aspects, which makes him prune himself, and bristle up the crest of youth against your dignity. But I have sent for him to answer this, and for this cause a while we must neglect our holy purpose to Jerusalem. Cousin, on Wednesday next, our council we will hold at Windsor. So inform the lords. But come yourself with speed to us again for more is to be said and to be done than out of anger can be uttered. I will, my liege. Exeunt. Scene two. London. An apartment of the princes. Enter the Prince of Wales and Falstaff. Now, Hal, what time of day is it, lad? Thou art so fat-witted, with drinking of old sack and in buttoning thee after supper, and sleeping upon benches after noon, that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldst truly know. What a devil hast thou to do with the time of the day? Unless hours were cups of sack, and minutes capons, and clocks the tongues of bods, and dials the signs of leaping houses, and the blessed sun himself, a fair hot wench in flame-colored taffeta, I see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous as to demand the time of the day. Indeed, you come near me now, Hal, for we that take purses go by the moon and the seven stars, and not by Phoebus, he that wandering knight so fair. And I prithee, sweet wag, when thou art king, as God save thy grace, <laughs> majesty I should say for grace, thou wilt have none. What? None? No, by my troth. Not so much as will serve to prologue to an egg and butter. Well, how then? Come, roundly, roundly. Marry then, sweet wag, when thou art king. Let not us that are squires of the knight's body be called thieves of the day's beauty. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, minions of the moon. And let men say we be men of good government, being governed, as the sea is, by our noble and chaste mistress the moon, under whose countenance we steal. Thou sayest well, and it holds well, too, for the fortune of us that on the moon's men doth ebb and flow like the sea, being governed as the sea is by the moon. As for proof, now, a purse of gold most resolutely snatched on Monday night and most dissolutely spent on Tuesday morning, got with swearing lay by and spent with crying bring in now in as low an ebb as the foot of the ladder and by and by in as high a flow as the ridge of the gallows by the lord thou sayest true lad and is not my hostess of the tavern a, a most sweet wench as the honey of hybla my old lad of the castle and is not a buff jerkin a most sweet robe of durance how now, how now, mad wag, what in thy quips and thy quiddities? What a plague have I to do with a buff jerkin? Why, what a pox have I to do with my hostess of the tavern? Well, thou hast called her to a reckoning many a time and oft. Did I ever call for thee to pay thy part? No, I'll give thee thy due, thou hast paid all there. Yea, and elsewhere, so far as my coin would stretch, and where it would not, I have used my credit. Yea, and so used it, that were it not here apparent, that thou art heir apparent. But, I prithee, sweet wag, shall there be gallows standing in England when thou art king, and resolution thus fobbed as it is with the rusty curb of old father Antic the law? Do not thou, when thou art king... Hang a thief. No. Thou shalt. <laughs> Shall I? O oh, rare, by the Lord, I'll be a brave judge. Thou judgest false already. I mean, thou shalt have the hanging of the thieves, and so become a rare hangman. Well, how well, 
and in some sort it jumps with my humor as well as waiting in the court i can tell you for obtaining of suits yea for obtaining of suits whereof the hangman hath no lean wardrobe Splud! i am as melancholy as a gibcat or a lugged bear or an old lion or a lover's lute yea or the drone of a lincolnshire bagpipe what sayest thou to a hare or the melancholy of moorditch thou hast the most unsavoury similes and art indeed the most comparative rascaliest sweet young prince but hal i prithee trouble me no more with vanity i would to god thou and i knew where a commodity of good names were to be bought an old lord of the council rated me the other day in the street about you sir but i mocked him not and yet he talked very wisely but i regarded him not and yet he talked wisely and in the street too thou didst well for wisdom cries out in the streets and no man regards it oh thou hast damnable alliteration and art indeed able to corrupt a saint thou hast done much harm upon me hal god forgive thee for it before i knew thee hal i knew nothing and now am i if a man should speak truly little better than one of the wicked i must give over this life and i will give it over by the lord and i do not i am a villain i'll be damned for never a king's son in christendom where shall we take a purse to-morrow jack sounds where thou wilt lad i'll make one and i do not call me a villain and baffle me i see a good amendment of life in thee from praying to purse-taking why hal tis my vocation hal tis no sin for a man to labour in his vocation enter points points now shall we know if gansill have set a match oh if men were to be saved by merit what hole in hell were hot enough for him this is a most omnipotent villain that ever cried stand to a true man good morrow ned good morrow sweet hal what says monsieur remorse what says sir john jack and sugar jack how agrees the devil in thee about thy soul that thou soldest him on good friday last for a cup of madeira and a cold capon's leg sir john stands to his word the devil shall have his bargain for he was never yet a breaker of proverbs he will give the devil his due then thou art damned for keeping thy word with the devil else he had been damned for cozening the devil but lads my lads to-morrow morning by four o'clock early at gans hill there are pilgrims coming to canterbury with rich offerings and traders riding to london with fat purses i have wizards for you all and you have horses for yourselves gads hill lies to-night in rochester i have bespoke supper to-morrow night at east cheap we may do it as secure as sleep if you will go i will stuff your purses full of crowns if you will not tarry at home and be hanged hear ye yedward if i tarry at home and go not i'll hang you for going you will chops hal wilt thou make one who i rob i a thief not i by my faith oh there's neither honesty manhood nor good fellowship in thee nor thou camest not of the blood royal if thou darest not stand for ten shillings well then once in my days i'll be a madcap why that's well said well come what will i'll tarry at home by the lord i'll be a traitor then when thou art king i care not sir john i prithee leave the prince and me alone i will lay him down such reasons for this adventure that he he shall go well god give thee the spirit of persuasion and him the ears of profiting that what thou speakest may move and what he hears may be believed that the true prince may for recreation's sake prove a false thief for the poor abuses of the time want countenance farewell you shall find me in east cheap farewell the latter spring farewell all hallowed summer exit falstaff now my good sweet honey lord ride with us to-morrow 
I have a jest to execute that I cannot manage alone. Falstaff, Baldoff, Petzl, and Gadsell shall rob those men we have already waylaid. Yourself and I will not be there, and when they have the booty, if you and I do not rob them, cut this head off my shoulders. How shall we part with them in setting forth? Why, we will set forth before or after them, and appoint them a place of meeting, wherein it is at our pleasure to fail, and when they will adventure upon the exploit themselves, which they shall have no sooner achieved, but will set upon them. Yea, but... "'Tis like that they will know us by our horses, by our habits, and by every other appointment to be ourselves." "'Tut! Our horses they shall not see. I'll tie them in the wood. Our visitors we will change after we leave them, and, sirrah, I have cases of buckram for the nonce to emask our noted outward garments." "'Yea, but I doubt they will be too hard for us.' "'Well, for two of them, I know them to be as true-bred cowards as ever turn back. And for the third, if he fights longer than he sells reason, I'll forswear arms. The virtue of this jest will be the incomprehensible lies this same fat rogue will tell us when we meet at supper. How thirty at least he fought with, what wards, what blows, what extremities he endured. And in the reproof of this lies the jest. Well, I'll go with thee. Provide us all things necessary and meet me tomorrow night in Eastcheap. There I'll sup. Farewell. Farewell, my lord. Exit points. I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet, herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that, when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at, by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. But when they seldom come, they wished for come, and nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So, when this loose behavior I throw off, and pay the debt I never promise it, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. And like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation glittering over my fault shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend, making offense a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. Exit. Scene three. London. The palace. Enter the king, Northumberland, Worcester, Hotspur, Sir Walter Blunt, with others. My blood hath been too cold and temperate, unapt to stir at these indignities, and you have found me, for accordingly you tread upon my patience. But be sure I will from henceforth rather be myself, mighty and to be feared, than my condition which hath been smooth as oil, soft as young down, and therefore lost that title of respect which the proud soul ne'er pays but to the proud. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it, and that same greatness too which our own hands have holped to make so portly. My lord! Worcester, get thee gone, for I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. O oh, sir, your presence is too bold and peremptory, and majesty might never yet endure the moody frontier of a servant brow. You have good leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we shall send for you. Exit Worcester. You were about to speak. To North. Yea, my good lord, those prisoners in your highness' name demanded, which Harry Percy here at Holmdon took were, as he says, not with such strength denied, as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or misprision, is guilty of this fault, and not my son. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, and his chin new-reaped, showed like a stubble-landed harvest home. 
he was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a pouncet box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again, who therewith angry, when it next came there, took it in snuff, and still he smiled and talked, and as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves, unmannerly, to bring a slovenly, unhandsome course betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms he questioned me, among the rest, demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting with my wounds being cold, to be so pestered with a popinjay, out of my grief and my impatience, answered neglectingly, I know not what. He should or he should not, for he made me mad to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet, and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark! and telling me that the sovereignest thing on earth was parmacetti for an inward bruise, and that it was great pity, so it was, this villainous saltpetre should be digged out of the bowels of the harmless earth, which many a good tall fellow had destroyed so cowardly, and but for these vile guns he would himself have been a soldier. This bald, unjointed chat of his, my lord, I answered indirectly, as I said, and I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your high majesty. The circumstance considered, good my lord, what e'er Lord Harry Percy then had said to such a person, and in such a place, at such a time, with all the rest retold, may reasonably die, and never rise to do him wrong, or any way impeach what then he said, so he unsay it now. Why, yet he doth deny his prisoners, but with proviso and exception, that we at our own charge shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer, who, on my soul, hath wilfully betrayed the lives of those that he did lead to fight against that great magician, damned Glendower, whose daughter, as we hear, the Earl of March hath lately married. Shall our coffers, then, be emptied to redeem a traitor home? Shall we but treason? and indent with fears when they have lost and forfeited themselves? No, on the barren mountains let him starve, for I shall never hold that man my friend whose tongue shall ask me for one penny cost to ransom home revolted Mortimer. Revolted Mortimer! He never did fall off my sovereign liege, but by the chance of war, to prove that true needs no more but one tongue for all those wounds, those mouthed wounds which valiantly he took, when on the gentle severn sedgy bank, in single opposition, hand to hand, he did confound the best part of an hour in changing hardiment with great Glendower. Three times they breathed, and three times did they drink upon agreement of swift severn's flood, who then, affrighted with their bloody looks, ran fearfully among the trembling reeds, and hid his crisp head in the hollow bank, blood stained with these valiant combatants. Never did base and rotten policy colour her working with such deadly wounds. Nor could the noble Mortimer receive so many, and all willingly. Then let him not be slandered with revolt. Thou dost belie him, Percy, thou dost belie him. He never did encounter with Glendower. I tell thee, he durst as well have met the devil alone as Owen Glendower for an enemy. Art thou not ashamed? But, sirrah, henceforth let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send me your prisoners with the speediest means, or you shall hear in such a kind from me as will displease you. My lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners, or you will hear of it. Exeunt King Henry, Blunt, and Train And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them. I will after straight and tell him so, for I will ease my heart, albeit I make a hazard of my head. What, drunk with choler? Stay and pause a while. Here comes your uncle. Re-enter Worcester. Speak of Mortimer. Sounds I will speak of him, and let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. Yea, on his part I'll empty all these veins, and shed my dear blood drop by drop in the dust but I will lift the downtrod Mortimer as high in the air as this unthankful king, as this ingrate and cankered Bolingbroke. Brother, the king hath made your nephew mad. Who struck up this heat after I was gone? He will forsooth have all my prisoners, 
and when I urged the ransom once again of my wife's brother, then his cheek looked pale, and on my face he turned an eye of death, trembling even at the name of Mortimer. I cannot blame him. Was not he proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood? He was. I heard the proclamation. And then it was when the unhappy king, whose wrongs in us God pardon, did set forth upon his Irish expedition, from whence he intercepted did return, to be deposed and shortly murdered. And for whose death we in the world's wide mouth live scandalized and foully spoken of. But soft, I pray you, did King Richard then proclaim my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to the crown? He did, myself did hear it. Nay, then I cannot blame his cousin King, that wished him on the barren mountain starve. But shall it be that you, that set the crown upon the head of this forgetful man, and for his sake wear the detested blot of murderous subornation, shall it be that you a world of curses undergo, being the agents, or base second means, the cords, the ladder, or the hangman, rather? Oh, pardon me that I descend so low to show the line and the predicament wherein you range under this subtle king. Shall it for shame be spoken in these days, or fill up chronicles in time to come, that men of your nobility and power did gauge them both in an unjust behalf, as both of you, God pardon it, have done? To put down Richard, that sweet lovely rose, and plant this thorn, this canker, Bolingbroke? And shall it in more shame be further spoken, that you are fooled, discarded, and shook off by him for whom these shames ye underwent? No. Yet time serves wherein you may redeem your banished honours, and restore yourselves into the good thoughts of the world again. Revenge the jeering and disdained contempt of this proud king, who studies day and night to answer all the debt he owes to you, even with the bloody payment of your deaths. Therefore I say— Peace, cousin, say no more. And now I will unclasp a secret book, and to your quick-conceiving discontents I'll read you matter deep and dangerous, as full of peril and adventurous spirit as to o'erwalk a current roaring loud on the unsteadfast footing of a spear. If he fall in, good night, or sink or swim, send danger from the east unto the west, so honour cross it from the north to south, and let them grapple. Oh, the blood more stirs to rouse a lion than to start a hare. Imagination of some great exploit drives him beyond the bounds of patience. By heaven, methinks it were an easy leap to pluck bright honour from the pale-faced moon, or dive into the bottom of the deep, where Fathomline could never touch the ground, and pluck up drowned honour by the locks, so that he that doth redeem her thence might wear without co-rival all her dignities, but out upon this half-faced fellowship. He apprehends a world of figures here, but not the form of what he should attend. Good cousin, give me audience for a while. I cry you mercy. Those same noble Scots that are your prisoners— I'll keep them all. By God, he shall not have a Scot of them. No, if a Scot would save his soul, he shall not. I'll keep them by this hand. You start away and lend no ear unto my purposes. Those prisoners you shall keep. Nay, I will, that's flat. He said he would not ransom Mortimer, forbade my tongue to speak of Mortimer. But I will find him when he lies asleep, and in his ear I'll holler Mortimer. Nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer, and give it him to keep his anchor still in motion. Hear you, cousin, a word. All studies here I solemnly defy, save how to gall and pinch this Bolingbroke, and that same sword and buckler Prince of Wales— but that I think his father loves him not, and would be glad he met with some mischance, I would have him poisoned with a pot of ale. Farewell, kinsman. I'll talk to you when you are better tempered to attend. Why, what a wasp-stung and impatient fool art thou to break into this woman's mood, tying thine ear to no tongue but thine own? Why, look you, I am whipped and scourged with rods, nettled and stung with pismires, when I hear of this vile politician Bolingbroke, in Richard's time. Uh, what do you call the place? Oh, a plague upon it. It is in Gloucestershire. Twas where the madcap duke his uncle kept. His uncle York, where I first bowed my knee unto this king of smiles, this Bolingbroke. Oh, 
Splud, uh, when you and he came back from Ravensburg. At Berkeley Castle. You say true. Why, what a candy deal of courtesy this fawning greyhound then did proffer me. Look, when his infant fortune came to age, and gentle Harry Percy, and kind cousin, the devil take such cozeners. God forgive me. Uh, good uncle, tell your tale. I have done. Nay, if you have not, to it again. We will stay your leisure. I have done, i' faith. Then once more to your Scottish prisoners. Deliver them up without their ransom straight, and make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland, which, for diverse reasons which I shall send you written, be assured will easily be granted. You, my lord, to Northumberland, your son in Scotland being thus employed, shall secretly into the bosom creep of that same noble prelate well beloved, the Archbishop. Of York, is it not? True, who bears hard his brother's death at Bristol, the Lord Scrope. I speak not this in estimation of what I think might be, but what I know is ruminated, plotted, and set down, and only stays but to behold the face of that occasion that shall bring it on. I smell it. Upon my life it will do well. Before the game is afoot, thou still let'st slip. Why, it cannot choose but be a noble plot. And then the power of Scotland and of York to join with Mortimer? <laughs> and so they shall. In faith it is exceedingly well aimed. And tis no little reason bids us speed to save our heads by raising of a head. For bear ourselves as even as we can, the king will always think him in our debt, and think we think ourselves unsatisfied till he hath found a time to pay us home, and see already how he doth begin to make us strangers to his looks of love. He does, he does. We'll be revenged on him. Cousin, farewell. No further go in this than I by letters shall direct your course. When time is ripe, which will be suddenly, I'll steal to Glendower and Lord Mortimer, where you and Douglas and our powers at once, as I will fashion it, shall happily meet, to bear our fortunes in our own strong arms, which now we hold at much uncertainty. Farewell, good brother. We shall thrive, I trust. Uncle, adieu. Oh, let the hours be short, till fields and blows and groans applaud our sport. Exeunt. End of Act One Act Two of Henry the Fourth, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry the Fourth, Part One, by William Shakespeare. Scene One, Rochester, an inn yard. Enter a carrier with a lantern in his hand. Hi-ho, and it be not four by the day, I'll be hanged. Charles Wayne is over the new chimney, and yet a horse not packed. What, ostler? Adon, adon. I pray thee, Tom, beat cut saddle, put a few flocks in the point. Poor jade is wrung in the withers out of all cess. Enter another carrier. Peas and beans are as dank here as a dog, and that is the next way to give poor jades the bots. This house is turned upside down since Robin Ostler died. Poor fellow. Never joyed since the price of oats rose. It was the death of him. I think this be the most villainous house in all London Road for fleas. I am stung like a tench. Like a tench. By the mass, there's ne'er a king christened could be better bit than I have been since the first cock. Why, they will allow us ne'er a Jordan, and then we leak in your chimney, and your chamber lie breeds fleas like a loach. What ostler? Come away and be hanged. I have a gammon of bacon and two razors of ginger to be delivered as far as Charing Cross. God's body! The turkeys in my pannier are quite starved. What ossery plague on thee? Hast thou never an eye in thy head? Canst not hear? And twere not as good deed as drink to break the pate on thee, I am a very villain. Come and be hanged. Hast thou no faith in thee? Enter Gadshill. Good morrow, carriers. What's o'clock? 
I think it be two o'clock. I pray thee, lend me thy lantern, to see my gelding in the stable. Nay, by God, soft, I know trick worth to have that in faith. I pray thee, lend me thine. Ay, when, canst tell? Lend me thy lantern, quoth he. Marry, I'll see thee hanged first. Sirrah, carrier, what time do you mean to come to London? Time enough to go to bed with a candle, I warrant thee. Come, neighbour, mugs will call up the gentlemen. They will along with company, for they have great charge. Exeunt Carriers What ho? Chamberlain! At hand, quoth Pigpurse. That's even as fair as at hand, quoth the Chamberlain, for the veriest no more from picking of purses than giving direction doth from labouring. Thou layest the plot how. Enter Chamberlain. Good morrow, Master Godsill. It holds current that I told you yesternight is a Franklin in the wild of Kent hath brought three hundred marks with him in gold. I heard him tell it to one of his company last night at supper. A kind of auditor, one that hath abundance of charge too, God knows what. They are up already and call for eggs and butter. They will away presently. Sirrah, if they meet not with St. Nicholas, clerks, I'll give thee this neck. No, I'll none of it. I pray thee keep that for the hangman, for I know thou worshippest St. Nicholas as truly as a man of falsehood may. What, talkest thou to me of the hangman? If I hang, I'll make a fat pair of gallows, for if I hang, old Sir John hangs with me, and thou knowest he is no starveling. Tut! There are other Trojans that thou dreamest not of, the which for sport's sake are content to do the profession some grace, that would, if matters should be looked into, for their own credit's sake make all whole. I am joined with no footland rakers, no long staff sixpenny strikers, none of these mad mustachio purple hued malt worms, but with nobility and tranquillity, burgomasters and great oneers, such as can hold in, such as will strike sooner than speak, and speak sooner than drink, and drink sooner than pray, and yet zooms I lie. For they pray continually to their saint, the Commonwealth, or rather, not pray to her, but pray on her, for they ride up and down on her, and make her their boots. What? The Commonwealth their boots? Will she hold out water in foul way? She will, she will. Justice hath liquored her. We steal as in a castle, cocksure. We have the receipt of fern seed. We walk invisible. Nay, by my faith, I think you are more beholden to the night than to fern seed for your walking invisible. Give me thy hand. Thou shalt have a share in our purchase, as I am a true man. Nay, rather let me have it, as you are a false thief. Go to. Homo is a common name to all men. Bid the ostler bring my gelding out of the stable. Farewell, you muddy knave. Exeunt. Scene two, the highway, near Gad's Hill. Enter Prince Henry and Poins. Come, shelter, shelter. I have removed Falstaff's horse, and he frets like a gummed velvet. Stand close. Enter Falstaff. Poins! Poins and be hanged! Poins! Peace, you fat kidneyed rascal. What a brawling dost thou keep? Where's Poins, Hal? He has walked up to the top of the hill. I'll go seek him. I'm accursed to rob in that thief's company. The rascal hath removed my horse and tied him I know not where. If I travel but four foot by the squire further afoot, I shall break my wind. Well, I doubt not but to die a fair death for all this if I escape hanging for killing that rogue. I have forsworn his company hourly any time this two and twenty years, and yet I am bewitched with the rogue's company. If the rascal hath not given me medicines to make me love him, I'll be hanged. It could not be else. I have drunk medicines. Poins! Hal! 
Ah, plague upon you both. Bardolf, Pito. I'll starve ere I'll rob a foot further. And twere not as good a deed as drink, to turn true man and to leave these rogues. I am the veriest varlet that ever chewed with a tooth. Eight yards of uneven ground is threescore and ten miles afoot with me, and the stony-hearted villains know it well enough. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be trolled one to another. They whistle. Whew! A plague upon you all! Give me my horse, you rogues! Give me my horse and be hanged! Peace, you fat guts! Lie down. Lay thine ear close to the ground and list, if thou canst hear the tread of travellers. Have you any levers to lift me up again, being down? Splud! I'll not bear mine own flesh so far afoot again for all the coin in thy father's exchequer. What a plague me need to coat me thus! Thou liest! Thou art not coated. Thou art uncoated. I prithee, good Prince Hal, help me to my horse, good King Son. Out, you rogue! Shall I be your ostler? Go hang thyself in thine own heir apparent garters. If I be tain, I'm peach for this. And I not made ballads made on you all and sung to filthy tunes? Let a cup of sack be my poison when a jest is so forward, and a foot too. I hate it. Enter Gadshill, Bardolph, and Peto. Stand! So I do, against my will. Oh, tis our setter. I know his voice. Bardolph, what news? Case ye, case ye, on with your visits. There's money of the king's coming down the hill. Tis going to the king's exchequer. You lie, ye rogue. Tis going to the king's tavern. There's enough to make us all. To be hanged? Sirs. You four shall front them in the narrow lane. Ned Poins and I will walk lower. If they escape from your encounter, then they light on us. How many be there of them? Some eight or ten. Sounds. Will they not rob us? What? A coward, Sir John Punch? Oh, indeed, I am not John of Gaunt, your grandfather. But yet, no coward, Hal. Well, we leave that to the proof. Sirrah, Jack, thy horse stands behind the hedge. When thou needest him, there thou shalt find him. Farewell, and stand fast. Now cannot I strike him, if I should be hanged. Ned, where are our disguises? Here, hard by. Stand close. Exit Prince Henry and Poins. Now, my masters, happy man be his dole, say I. Every man to his business. Enter the Travellers. Come, neighbor, the boy shall lead our horses down the hill. We'll walk a foot a while and ease our legs. Stand. Stand. Jesus bless us. Strike. Down with them. Cut the villains' throats. Ah, horse sun caterpillars, bacon fed knaves. They hate us, youth. Down with them. Fleece them. Oh, we are undone, both we and ours, for ever. Hang ye, gore bellied knaves. Are ye undone? No, ye fat chuffs. I would your store were here. On, Bacons, on! Watch ye, knaves, young men must live. You are grandeurs, are ye? We'll jure ye, faith. Here they rob them and bind them. Exeunt. Re-enter Prince Henry and Poins. The thieves have bound the true men. Now could thou and I rob the thieves, and go merrily to London. It would be argument for a week, laughter for a month, and a good jest forever. Stand close. I hear them coming. Enter the thieves again. Come, my masters, and let us share, and then to horse before day. And the prince and poins be not two errant cowards, there's no equity stirring. There's no more valor in that poins than in a wild duck. Your money! Villains! As they are sharing, the prince and poins set upon them. They all run away, and Falstaff, after a blow or two, Runs away, too, leaving the booty behind them. <laughs> Got with much ease. Now Mary lead a horse. The thieves are all scattered and possessed with fear so strongly that they dare not meet each other. Each takes his fellow for an officer. Away, good Ned. Falstaff sweats to death and lards the lean earth as he walks along. <laughs> Were it not for laughing, I should pity him. <laughs> How the rogue 
roared. Excellent. Scene three, Warkworth Castle. Enter Hotspur, Solus, reading a letter. But for mine own part, my lord, I could be well contented to be there, in respect of the love I bear your house. He could be contented. Why is he not, then? In respect of the love he bears our house? He shows in this he loves his own barn better than he loves our house. Uh, let me see some more. The purpose you undertake is dangerous. Why, that's certain. It is dangerous to take a cold, to sleep, to drink. But I tell you, my lord, fool, out of this nettle, danger, we pluck this flower safety. Uh, the purpose you undertake is dangerous, the friends you have named uncertain, the time itself unsorted, and your whole plot too light for the counterpoise of so great an opposition. <laughs> say you so? Say you so? Now oh, I say unto you again, you are a shallow, cowardly hind, and you lie. What a lack-brain is this? By the Lord, our plot is as good a plot as ever was laid. Our friends true and constant, a good plot, good friends, and full of expectation. An excellent plot, very good friends. What a frosty-spirited rogue is this! Why, my lord of York commends the plot and the general course of action. Sounds, and I were now by this rascal I could brain him with his lady's fan. Is there not my father, my uncle, and myself, Lord Edmund Mortimer, my lord of York, and Owen Glendower? Is there not besides the Douglas? Have I not all their letters to meet me in arms by the ninth of next month? And, and are they not some of them set forward already? What a pagan rascal is this! An infidel! Ah! You shall now see in very sincerity of fear and cold heart will he to the king and lay open all our proceedings. Oh, I could divide myself and go to buffets for moving such a dish of skim milk with so honourable an action. Hang him! Let him tell the king. We are prepared. I will set forward to-night. Enter Lady Percy. How now, Kate? I must leave you within these two hours. Oh, my good lord, why are you thus alone? For what offence have I this fortnight been a banished woman from my Harry's bed? Tell me, sweet lord, what is it takes from thee thy stomach, pleasure, and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth, and start so often when thou sitst alone? Why hast thou lost the fresh blood in thy cheeks, and given my treasures, and my rights of thee, to thick-eyed musing and cursed melancholy? In thy faint slumbers I by thee have watched, and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars, speak terms of manage to thy bounding steed, cry courage to the field! And thou hast talked of sallies and retires, of trenches, tents, of palisados, frontiers, parapets, of basilisks, of cannon, culverin, of prisoners ransom, and of soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. Thy spirit within thee hath been so at war, and thus hath so bestirred thee in thy sleep, that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow like bubbles in a late disturbed stream, and in thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath on some great sudden hest. Oh, what portents are these! Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, else he loves me not. What ho? Enter servant. Is Gilliams with a packet gone? He is, my lord, an hour ago. Hath Butler brought those horses from the sheriff? One horse, my lord, he brought even now. What horse? Uh, a roan? A crop-ear, is it not? It is, my lord. That roan shall buy my throne. Well, I will back him straight. O oh, Esperance, bid Butler lead him forth into the park. Exit servant. But hear you, my lord! What sayest thou, my lady? What is it carries you away? Why, my horse, my love, my horse. Out, you mad-headed ape! A weasel hath not such a deal of spleen as you are tossed with. In faith, I'll know your business, Harry, that I will. I fear my brother Mortimer doth stir about his title, and hath sent for you to line his enterprise. But if you go— So far afoot, I shall be weary, love. 
Come, come, you parakeeto, answer me directly unto this question that I ask. In faith, I'll break thy little finger, Harry, that I will, and if thou wilt not tell me all things true. Away, away, you trifler. Love, I love thee not. I care not for thee, Kate. This is no world to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips. We must have bloody noses and cracked crowns, and pass them current, too. God's me, my horse. Why sayest thou, Kate, what, what wouldst thou have with me? Do you not love me? Do you not, indeed? Well, do not, then. For since you love me not, I will not love myself. Do you not love me? Nay, tell me whether thou speak'st in jest or no. Come, wilt thou see me ride? And when I am on horseback, I will swear I love thee infinitely. But hark you, Kate, I must not have you henceforth question me whither I go, nor reason whereabout. Whither I must, I must, and to conclude this evening must I leave you, gentle Kate. I know you wise, but yet no farther wise than Harry Percy's wife. Constant you are, but yet a woman, and for secrecy no lady closer. For I well believe thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know. And so far will I trust thee, gentle Kate. How, so far? Not an inch further. But hark you, Kate, whither I go, thither shall you go too. Today will I set forth, tomorrow you. Will this content you, Kate? It must, of force. Exeunt. Scene 4. The Boar's Head Tavern, East Cheap. Enter Prince Henry and Poins. Ned, prithee come out of that fat room and lend me thy hand to laugh a little. Where hast been, Al? <laughs> With three or four loggerheads, amongst three or four score hogsheads. I have sounded a very base string of humility. Sirrah, I am sworn brother to a leash of drawers, and can call them by their christened names as Tom, Dick, and Francis. They take it already upon their salvation that, though I be but Prince of Wales, yet I am the King of Courtesy. And tell me flatly, I am no proud jack like Falstaff, but a Corinthian, a lad of metal, a good boy. By the Lord, so they call me. And when I am King of England, I shall command all the good lads of East Cheap. They call drinking deep, dying scarlet. And when you breathe in your watering, they cry, Hem! and bid you play it off. To conclude, I am so good a proficient in one quarter of an hour that I can drink with any tinker in his own language during my life. I tell thee, Ned, thou hast lost much honor that thou were not with me in this action. But sweet Ned, to sweeten which name of Ned, I'd give thee this pennyworth of sugar, clapped even now into my hand by an underskinker, one that never spake other English in his life than eight shillings and six pence, and you are welcome, with this shrill edition, Anon, anon, sir! Score a pint of bastard in the half-moon, or, or so, but, Ned, to drive away the time till Falstaff come, I prithee, do those stand in some by-room while, while I question my puny drawer to, to what end he gave me the sugar, and do thou never leave calling Francis, that this tale to me may be nothing but anon! Step aside, and I'll show thee a precedent. Francis? Thou art perfect. Francis! Exit points. Enter Francis. Anon, anon, sir. Look down into the palm garnet, Ralph. Come hither, Francis. My lord? Uh, how long hast thou to serve, Francis? Forsooth, five years, and as much as Francis. to... Francis! Anon, anon, sir. Five year? By our lady, a long lease for the clinking of pewter. But, Francis, darest thou be so valiant as to play the coward with thy indenture, and show it a fair pair of heels and run from it? O oh, Lord, sir, I'll be sworn upon all the books in England I could find in my heart. Francis? And on, sir. Uh, how old art thou, Francis? Let me see. About Michaelmas next I shall be. Francis! And on, sir. Pray stay a little, my lord. Nay, but hark you, Francis. For the sugar thou gavest me, uh, twenty, twas a pennyworth, was not? O oh, Lord, I would it had been two. 
and I will give thee for it a thousand pound. Ask me when thou wilt, and thou shalt have it. Francis! Anon! Anon! Anon, Francis? No, Francis, but tomorrow, Francis. Or, Francis, a Thursday. Or indeed, Francis, when thou wilt, but Francis... My lord? Wilt thou rob this leathern jerkin, crystal button, not pated agate ring, puke stocking, gaddis garter, smooth tongue, Spanish pouch? Oh, lord, sir, who do you mean? Why, then, your brown bastard is your only drink. For look you, Francis, your white canvas doublet will sully. In Barbary, sir, it cannot come to so much. What, sir? Francis! Away, you rogue, dost thou not hear them call? Here they both call him. The drawer stands amazed not knowing which way to go. Enter Vintner. What, standest thou still, and hearest such a calling? Look to the guests within. Exit Francis. My lord, old Sir John, with half a dozen more, are at the door. Shall I let them in? Let them alone a while, and then open the door. Exit Vintner. Poins. Re-enter Poins. Anon, anon, sir. Sirrah, Falstaff, and the rest of the thieves are at the door. Shall we be merry? As merry as crickets, my lad. But hark ye, what cunning match have you made with this jest of the drawer? Come, what's the issue? I am now of all humors that have showed themselves humors since the old days of good man Adam to the pupil age of this present twelve o'clock at midnight. Re-enter Francis. What's a clock, Francis? Anon, anon, sir. Exit. That ever this fellow should have fewer words than a parrot, and yet the son of a woman. His industry is upstairs and downstairs, his eloquence the parcel of a reckoning. I am not yet of Percy's mind, the hotspur of the north. He that kills me some six or seven dozen of Scots at a breakfast, washes his hands and says to his wife, Fie upon this quiet life, I want work. Oh, my sweet Harry, says she, how many hast thou killed today? Give my roan horse a drench, says he. And, and, Answers, some fourteen, an hour after, a trifle, a trifle. I prithee, Colin Falstaff, I'll play Percy, and that damned bronze shall play Dame Mortimer, his wife. Revo, says the drunkard, Colin Ribs, Colin Tallow. Enter Falstaff, Gadshill, Bardolph, and Peto, Francis following with wine. Welcome, Jack. Where hast thou been? A plague of all cowards, I say, and a vengeance, too, merry and amen. Give me a cup of sack, boy. Ere I lead this life long, I'll sow nether stocks, and mend them, and put them, too. A plague of all cowards. Give me a cup of sack, rogue. Is there no virtue extant? He drinks. Didst thou ever see Titan kiss a dish of butter? Pitiful-hearted Titan that melted at the sweet tail of the sun. If thou didst, then behold, that compound. <laughs> you rogue, here's lime in this sack too. There is nothing but roguery to be found in villainous man, yet a coward is worse than a cup of sack with lime in it. A villainous coward. Go thy ways, old Jack, die when thou wilt, if manhood, good manhood, be not forgot upon the face of the earth, then am I a shot and herring. There live not three good men unhanged in England, and one of them is fat and grows old. God help the while. A bad world, I say. I would I were a weaver. I could sing psalms or anything. A plague of all cowards, I say still. How now, Woolsack? What mutter you? A king's son. If I do not beat thee out of thy kingdom with a dagger of lath, and drive all thy subjects afore thee like a flock of wild geese, I'll never wear hair on my face more, you prince of Wales. Why, you horse unround man, what's the matter? Are not you a coward? Answer me to that, and points there. Zounds, ye fat potch, and ye call me coward. By the Lord, I'll stab thee. Oh, I call thee coward. I'll see thee damned that I call thee coward, but I would give a thousand pound. I could run as fast as thou canst. You are straight enough in the shoulders. You care not who sees your back. Call you that backing of your friends? 
A plague upon such backing! Give me them that will face me. Give me a cup of sack. I am a rogue if I drunk today. O oh, villain, thy lips are scarce wiped since thou drunkest last. All's one for that. He drinks. A plague of all cowards, still say I. What's the matter? What's the matter? <laughs> there be four of us here have ta'en a thousand pounds this day morning. Where is it, Jack? Where is it? Where is it? Taken from us it is. A hundred upon poor four of us. What? A hundred men? I am a rogue. If I were not at half-sword with a dozen of them two hours together. I have escaped by miracle. I am eight times thrust through the doublet, four through the hose, and my buckler cut through and through, my sword hacked like a handsaw, ecce signum. I never dealt better since I was a man. All would not do. A plague of all cowards. Let them speak. If they speak more or less than truth, they are villains of the sons of darkness. Speak, sirs. How was it? We four set upon some dozen. Sixteen, at least, my lord. And bound them. Na, na, they were not bound. You rogue, they were bound, every man of them, or I am a Jew, else an Hebrew Jew. As we were sharing, some six or seven fresh men set upon us. And unbound the rest, and then come in the other. What? Fought you with them? All? All. I know not what you call all, but if I fought not with fifty of them, I am a bunch of radish. If there were not two or three and fifty upon poor old Jack, then am I no two-legged creature. Pray God you have not murdered some of them. Nay, that's past praying for. I have peppered two of them. Two, I am sure I have paid, two rogues in buckram suits. I tell thee what, Hal. If I tell thee a lie, spit in my face, call me horse. Thou knowest my old ward. Here I lay, and thus I bore my point. Four rogues in buckram that drive what, me. What, four? Thou saidst but two even now. Four, Hal, I told thee four. Aye, aye, he said four. These four came all affront, and mainly thrust at me. I made me no more ado, but took all their seven points in my target thus. Seven? Why, there were but four even now. In buckram? Aye, four, in buckram suits. At seven, by these hills, or I am a villain else. Prithee let him alone. We shall have more anon. Dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. Do so, for it is worth the listening to. These nine in buckram that I told thee of... So, two more already. Their points being broken... Down fell their hose. "'Began to give me ground, but I followed me close, "'came in foot and hand, and with a thought seven of the eleven I paid.' "'Oh, monstrous! Eleven buckram men grown out of two. "'But, as the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green "'came at my back and let drive at me, "'for it was so dark, Hal, that thou couldst not see thy hand.' These lies are like their father that begets them. Gross as a mountain, open, palpable. Why, thou clay-brained guts, thou naughty-pated fool, thou horse and obscene, greasy tallow-catch! What? Art thou mad? Art thou mad? Is not the truth the truth? Why, how couldst thou know these men in Kendall Green, when it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? Come, tell us your reason. What sayest thou to this? Come, your reason, Jack, your reason. What, upon compulsion? Zounds, and I were at the strapedo, or all the racks in the world, I would not tell you on compulsion. Give you a reason on compulsion. If reasons were as plentiful as blackberries, I would give no man a reason upon compulsion, I. I'll be no longer guilty of this sin. This sanguine coward, this bed-presser, 
this horseback breaker, this huge hill of flesh. Blood, you starveling, you elfskin, you trite neat's tongue, you bull's pizzle, you stockfish. Oh, for breath to utter what is like thee, you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile standing tuck. Well, breathe a while, and then to it again. And when thou hast tired thyself in base comparisons, hear me speak but this. Mark, Jack. We two saw you four set on four, and bound them and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you four, and with a word outface you from your prize and have it. Yea, and can show it you here in the house. And, Falstaff, you carried your guts away as nimbly with as quick dexterity and roared for mercy and still run and roared as ever I heard Bullcalf. What a slave art thou to hack thy sword as thou hast done, and then say it was in fight. What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find out to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? Come, let's hear, Jack. What trick hast thou now? By the Lord, I, I knew ye as well as he that made ye. Oh, I hid you, my masters. Was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? Why, thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules, but beware instinct. The lion will not touch the true prince. Instinct is a great matter. I was now a coward on instinct. I I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life, I for a valiant lion, and thou for a true prince. But, by the Lord, lads, I am glad you have the money. Hostess, clap to the doors. Watch to-night, pray to-morrow. Gallants, lads, boys, hearts of gold, all the titles of good fellowship come to you. What? Shall we be merry? Shall we have a play extempore? Content, and the argument shall be thy running away. Ah, no more of that, Hal, and thou lovest me? Enter Hostess. Oh, Jesu, my lord the prince! How now, my lady the hostess? What sayest thou to me? Marry, my lord, there is a nobleman of the court at door would speak with you. He says he comes from your father. Give him as much as will make him a royal man, and send him back again to my mother. What matter of man is he? An old man. What doth gravity out of his bed at midnight? Shall I give him his answer? Prithee do, Jack. <laughs> Faith, and I'll send him packing. Exit Falstaff. Now, sirs, by your lady you fought fair, and so did you, Pito. So did you, Bardolph. You are lions too. You ran away upon instinct. You will not touch the true prince. No. Fie. Faith, I ran when I saw the others run. Tell me now in earnest, how came Falstaff's sword so hacked? Why, he hacked at it with his dagger, and said he would swear truth out of England, but he would make you believe it was done in fight, and persuaded us to do the like. Yea, and to tickle our noses with spear grass to make them bleed, and then to beslubber our garments with it, and swear it was the blood of true men. I did that I did not this seven year before. I blushed to hear his monstrous devices. Oh, villain! Thou stolest a cup of sack eighteen years ago, and were taken with the manor, and ever since thou hast blushed extempore. Thou hadst fire and sword on thy side, and yet thou ranst away. What instinct hadst thou for it? My lord, do you see these meteors? Do you behold these exhalations? I do. What think you they portend? Hot livers and cold purses. Collar, my lord, if rightly taken. No, if rightly taken, halter. Re-enter Falstaff. Here comes lean Jack. Here comes barebone. How now, my sweet creature of bombast? How long is to go, Jack, since thou sawest thine own knee? My own knee? 
when I was about thy years, Hal, I, I was not an eagle's talon in the waist. I could have crept into any alderman's thumb-ring. A plague of sighing and grief. It blows a man up like a bladder. There's villainous news abroad. Here was Sir John Bracy from your father. You must to the court in the morning. That same mad fellow of the north, Percy, and he of Wales, that gave Amamon the bastinado, and made Lucifer cuckold, and swore the devil his true liegeman upon the cross of a Welsh hook. What a plague call you him? Oh, Glendower. Owen, Owen, uh, the same, and his son-in-law Mortimer, and uh, old Northumberland, and uh, that sprightly Scot of Scots, Douglas, that runs a horseback up a hill perpendicular. He that rides at high speed, and with his pistol kills a sparrow flying. You have hit it. So did he, never the sparrow. Well, that rascal hath good metal in him. He will not run. Why, what a rascal art thou then, to praise him so for running? A horseback, ye cuckoo, but a foot he will not budge a foot. Yes, Jack, upon instinct. I grant ye upon instinct. Well, he is there too, and one more dake, and a thousand blue caps more. Worcester is stolen away to-night. Thy father's beard is turned white with the news. You may buy land now as cheap as stinking mackerel. Why, then, it is like if there come a hot June, and this civil buffeting hold, we shall buy maidenheads as they buy hobnails by the hundreds. By the mass, lad, thou sayest true. It is like we shall have good trading that way. But tell me, Hal, are not thou horrible afeard? Thou being heir apparent, could the world pick thee out three such enemies again as that fiend Douglas, that spirit Percy, and that devil Glendower? Art thou not horribly afraid? Doth not thy blood thrill at it? Not a whit of faith. I lack some of thy instinct. Well, thou wert be horribly chid to-morrow when thou comest to thy father. If thou love me, practice an answer. Do thou stand for my father, and examine me upon the particulars of my life. Shall I? Content. This chair shall be my state, this dagger my sceptre, and this cushion my crown. Thy state is taken for a joined stool, thy golden sceptre for a leaden dagger, and thy precious rich crown for a pitiful bald crown. Well, and the fire of grace be not quite out of thee, now shalt thou be moved. Give me a cup of sack to make my eyes look red, that it may be thought I have wept, for I must speak in passion, and I will do it in King Cambyses' vein. Well, here is my leg. And here is my speech. Stand aside, nobility. Ah, oh, Jesu, this is excellent sport of faith. Weep not, sweet queen, for trickling tears are vain. Oh, the father, how he holds his countenance. For God's sake, lords, convey my tristful queen, for tears do stop the floodgates of her eyes. Ah, oh, Jesu, he doth it as like one of these harlotry players as ever I see. Peace, good paint-pot, peace, good tickle-brain. Harry, I do not only marvel where thou spendest thy time, but also how thou art accompanied. For, though the chamomile, the more it is trodden on, the faster it grows, yet youth, the more it is wasted, the sooner it wears. That thou art my son, I have partly thy mother's word, partly my own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trick of thine eye, and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip, that doth warrant me. If then thou be son to me, here lies the point. Why, being son to me, art thou so pointed at? Shall the blessed son of heaven prove a maker and eat blackberries? A question not to be asked. Shall the son of England prove a thief and take purses? A question to be asked. There is a thing, Harry, which thou hast often heard of, and it is known to many in our land by the name of pitch. This pitch, as ancient writers do report, doth defile. So doth the company thou keepest. For Harry, now, I do not speak to thee in drink, but in tears, not in pleasure, but in passion, not in words only, but in woes also. And yet... 
there is a virtuous man whom i have often noted in thy company but uh, i know not his name what manner of man an it like your majesty oh, a goodly portly man a faith and a corpulent of a cheerful look a, a pleasing eye and a most noble carriage and as i think his age some fifty or by our lady inclining to three score and now i remember me his name is falstaff if that man should be lewdly given he deceiveth me for harry i see virtue in his looks if then the tree may be known by the fruit as the fruit by the tree then peremptorily i speak it there is virtue in that falstaff him keep with the rest banish and tell me now thou naughty varlet tell me where hast thou been this month dost thou speak like a king do thou stand for me and i'll play my father depose me if thou dost it half so gravely so majestically both in word and matter hang me up by the heels for a rabbit sucker or a poulter's hair well here i am set and here i stand judge my masters now harry whence came you my noble lord from east cheap the complaints i hear of thee are grievous Splurt, my lord they are false nay i'll tickle ye for a young prince of faith swearest thou ungracious boy henceforth ne'er look on me thou art violently carried away from grace there is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man a ton of man is thy companion why dost thou converse with that trunk of humours that bolting hutch of beastliness that swollen parcel of dropsies that huge bombard of sack that stuffed cloak bag of guts that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly that reverend vice that grey iniquity that father ruffian that vanity in years wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it wherein neat and clean and cleanly but to carve a caper and eat it wherein cunning but in craft wherein crafty but in villainy wherein villainous but in all things wherein worthy but in nothing i would your grace would take me with you who means your grace that villainous abominable misleader of youth falstaff that old white-bearded satan my lord the man i know i know thou dost but to say i know more harm in him than in myself i would to say more than i know that he is old the more the pity his white hairs do witness it but that he is saving your reverence a whore master that i utterly deny if sack and sugar be a fault god help the wicked if to be old and marry be a sin then many an old host that i know is damned if to be fat be to be hated then pharaoh's lean kine ought to be loved no my good lord banish peto banish bardolph banish poins but for sweet jack falstaff kind jack falstaff true jack falstaff valiant jack falstaff and therefore more valiant being as he is old jack falstaff banish not him thy harry's company banish not him thy harry's company banish plump jack and banish all the world i do i will a knocking heard Exeunt hostess, Francis, and Bardolph. Re-enter Bardolph, running. Oh, my lord, my lord! The sheriff with a most monstrous watch is at the door. Out, ye rogue! Play out the play! I have much to say in the behalf of that Falstaff. Re-enter the hostess. Oh, Jesu! My lord, my lord! Hey, hey, the devil rides upon a fiddlestick. What's the matter? The sheriff and all the watcher at the door. They are come to search the house. Shall I let them in? Dost thou hear how? 
never caught a true piece of gold to counterfeit. Thou art essentially mad without seeming so. And thou a natural coward without instinct. I deny your major, if you will deny the sheriff so. If not, let him enter. If I become not a cart as well as another man, a plague on my bringing up. I hope I shall soon be strangled with a halter as another. Go hide thee behind the heiress. The rest walk up above. Now, my masters, for a true face and good conscience. Both which I have had, but their date is out, and therefore I'll hide me. Call in the sheriff. Exeunt all except Prince Henry and Peto. Enter sheriff and the carrier. Now, master sheriff, what is your will with me? First pardon me, my lord, a hue and cry hath followed certain men unto this house. What men? One of them is well known, my gracious lord, a gross fat man. As fat as butter. And the man, I do assure you, is not here. For I myself at this time have employed him. And, Sheriff, I will engage my word to thee that, that I will, by to-morrow dinner-time, send him to answer thee, or any man. For anything he shall be charged withal. And so let me entreat you, leave the house. I will, my lord. There are two gentlemen, have in this library lost three hundred marks. It may be so. If he have robbed these men, he shall be answerable. And so, farewell. Good night, my noble lord. I think it is good morrow, is it not? Indeed, my lord, I think it be two o'clock. Exeunt Sheriff and Carrier This oily rascal is known as well as Paul's. Go call him forth. Falstaff, fast asleep behind the arras, and snorting like a horse. Hark! How hard he fetch his breath. Search his pockets. He searcheth his pockets, and findeth certain papers. What hast thou found? Nothing but papers, my lord. Let's see what they be. Read them. Item, a capon, two shillings, tuppence. Item, sauce, fourpence. Item, sack, two gallons, five shillings, eightpence. Item, anchovies and sack after supper, two shillings, sixpence. Item, bread, halfpenny. Oh, monstrous! But this one halfpenny worth of bread to this intolerable deal of sack! What there is else, keep close. We'll read it at more advantage. There let him sleep till day. I'll to the court in the morning. We must all to the wars and thy place shall be honorable. I'll procure this fat rogue a charge of foot, and I know his death will be a march of twelve score. The money shall be paid back again with advantage. Be with me betimes in the morning, and so, good morrow, Pito. Good morrow, good my lord. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of Henry the Fourth, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry the Fourth, Part One by William Shakespeare. Act Three. Scene One. Bangor, the Archdeacon's house. Enter Hotspur, Worcester, Mortimer, and Glendower. These promises are fair, the parties sure, and our induction full of prosperous hope. Lord Mortimer and Cousin Glendower, will you sit down? And Uncle Wooster. Oh, plague upon it, I have forgot the map. No, here it is. Sit, Cousin Percy. Sit, good Cousin Hotspur. For by that name, as oft as Lancaster doth speak of you, his cheek looks pale, and with a rising sigh he wisheth you in heaven. And you in hell as oft as he hears Owen Glendower spoke of. I cannot blame him. At my nativity the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes, of burning cressets, and at my birth the frame and huge foundation of the earth shakes like a coward. Why, so it would have been done at the same season if your mother's cat had but kittened, though yourself had never been born. I say the earth did shake when I was born. And I say the earth was not of my mind, if you suppose as fearing you it shook. The heavens were all on fire. The earth did tremble. 
Well, then the earth shook to see the heavens on fire, and not in fear of your nativity. Diseased nature oftentimes breaks forth in strange eruptions, off the teeming earth, as with a kind of colic pinched and vexed by the imprisoning of unruly wind within her womb, which for enlargement striving shakes the old beldam earth and topples down steeples and moss-grown towers. At your birth our grandam earth, having this distemperature, in passion shook. Cousin, of many men I do not bear these crossings. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes. The goats ran from the mountains, and the herds were strangely clamorous to the frighted fields. These signs have marked me extraordinary, and all the courses of my life do show I am not in the role of common men. Where is he living, clipped in with the sea, that chides the banks of England, Scotland, Wales, which calls me pupil, or hath read to me? and bring him out that is but woman's son can trace me in the tedious ways of arts, and hold me pace in deep experiments. I think there's no man speaks better Welsh. I'll to dinner. Peace, cousin Percy. You will make him mad. I can call spirits from the vasty deep. Why, so can I, or so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? Why, I can teach you, cousin, to command the devil. And I can teach thee, cuz, to shame the devil, by telling truth. Tell truth and shame the devil. If thou have power to raise him, bring him hither, and I'll be sworn I have power to shame him hence. O, oh, while you live, tell truth, and shame the devil. Come, come, no more of this unprofitable chat. Three times hath Henry Bolingbroke made head against my power. Thrice from the banks of Wye and sandy-bottomed Severn have I sent him, bootless home and weather-beaten back. Home without boots, and in foul weather, too. How scapes he agues in the devil's name? Come, here's the map. Shall we divide our right according to our threefold order taken? The archdeacon hath divided it into three limits very equally. England, from Trent and Severn hitherto, by south and east is to my part assigned. All westward, Wales beyond the Severn shore, and all the fertile land within that bound, to Owen Glendower, and, dear cuz, to you the remnant northward, lying off from Trent, and our indentures tripartite are drawn, which being sealed interchangeably, a business that this night may execute, to-morrow, cousin Percy, you and I and my good Lord of Worcester will set forth to meet your father and the Scottish power, as is appointed us, at Shrewsbury. My father Glendower is not ready yet, not shall we need his help these fourteen days. Within that space you may have drawn together your tenants, friends, and neighboring gentlemen. A shorter time shall send me to you, lords, and in my conduct shall your ladies come, from whom you now must steal and take no leave, for there will be a world of water shed upon the parting of your wives and you. Methinks my moiety north from Burton here, and quantity equals not one of yours. See how this river comes me cranking in, and cuts me from the best of all my land a huge half-moon, a monstrous cantle out. I'll have the current in this place dammed up, and here the smug and silver trench shall run in a new channel, fair and evenly. It shall not wind with such deep indent, to rob me of so rich a bottom here. Not wind! It shall! It must! You see it doth! Yea, but mark how he bears his course, and runs me up, with like advantage on the other side gelding the opposed continent as much as on the other side it takes from you. Yea, but a little charge will trench him here, and on this north side win this cape of land, and then he runs straight and even. I'll have it so. A little charge will do it. I'll not have it altered. Will not you? No, nor shall you not. Who shall say me nay? Why, that will I. Well, let me not understand you, then. Speak it in Welsh. I can speak English, Lord, as well as you, for I was trained up in the English court, where, being but young, I framed to the harp many an English ditty lovely well, and gave the tongue a helpful ornament, a virtue that was never seen in you. Mary, and I am glad of it with all my heart. I had rather be a kitten and cry mew than one of these same meter ballad mongers. I had rather hear a brazen can-stick turned, or a dry wheel grate on the axle-tree, and that would set my teeth nothing on edge, nothing so much as mincing poetry. 
It is like the forced gait of a shuffling nag. Come, you shall have Trent turned. I do not care. I'll give thrice so much land to any well-deserving friend. But in the way of bargain, mark ye me, I'll cavil on the ninth part of a hair. Are the indentures drawn? Shall we be gone? The moon shines fair. You may away by night. I'll haste the rider, and withal break with your wives of your departure hence. I am afraid my daughter will run mad, so much she doteth on her Mortimer. Exit Glendower. Fie, cousin Percy, how you cross my father. I cannot choose. Sometimes he angers me with telling me of the Moldwarp and the ant, of the dreamer Merlin and his prophecies, and of a dragon and a finless fish, a clip-winged griffin and a molten raven, a couching lion and a ramping cat, and such a deal of skimble-scamble stuff as puts me from my faith. I tell you what, he held me last night at least nine hours in reckoning up the several devil's names that were his lackeys. I cried, Hum, and, well, go to, but marked him not a word. Oh, he is as tedious as a tired horse, a railing wife, worse than a smoky house. I had rather live with cheese and garlic in a windmill far than feed on Kate's and have him talk to me in any summer house in Christendom. In faith he is a worthy gentleman, exceedingly well-read and profited in strange concealments, valiant as a lion, and as wondrous affable and as bountiful as mines of India. Shall I tell you, cousin, he holds your temper in a high respect, and curbs himself even of his natural scope, when you come cross his humour, faith he does. I warrant you that man is not alive might so have tempted him as you have done, without the taste of danger and reproof. But do not use it oft, let me entreat you. In faith, my lord, you are too willful blame, and since your coming hither have done enough to put him quite besides his patience. You must needs learn, lord, to amend this fault. Though sometimes it show greatness, courage, blood, and that's the dearest grace it renders you, yet oftentimes it doth present harsh rage, defect of manners, want of government, pride, haughtiness, opinion, and disdain, the least of which, haunting a nobleman, loseth men's hearts, and leaves behind a stain upon the beauty of all parts besides, beguiling them of commendation. Well, I am schooled. Good manners be your speed. Here come our wives, and let us take our leave. Re-enter Glendower with the ladies. This is the deadly spite that angers me. My wife can speak no English, I no Welsh. My daughter weeps. She will not part with you. She'll be a soldier too. She'll to the wars. Good father, tell her that she and my Aunt Percy shall follow in your conduct speedily. Glendower speaks to her in Welsh, and she answers him in the same. She is desperate here, a peevish self-wind harlotry, one that no persuasion can do good upon. The lady speaks in Welsh. I understand thy looks, that pretty Welsh which thou pourst down from these swelling heavens, I am too perfect in, and, but for shame, in such a parley should I answer thee. The lady speaks again in Welsh. I understand thy kisses, and thou mine, and that's a feeling disputation. But I will never be a truant, love, till I have learned thy language, for thy tongue makes Welsh as sweet as ditties highly penned, sung by a fair queen in a summer's bower, with ravishing division to her lute. Nay, if you melt, then will she run mad. The lady speaks again in Welsh. Oh, I am ignorance itself in this. She bids you on the wanton rushes lay you down, and rest your gentle head upon her lap, and she will sing the song that pleaseth you, and on your eyelids crown the god of sleep, charming your blood with pleasing heaviness, making such difference twixt wake and sleep as is the difference betwixt day and night the hour before the heavenly harnessed team begins his golden progress in the east with all my heart i'll sit and hear her sing by that time will our book i think be drawn do so and those musicians that shall play to you hang in the air a thousand leagues from hence and straight they shall be here sit and attend Come, Kate, thou art perfect in lying down. Come, quick, quick, that I may lay my head in thy lap. 
Go, ye giddy goose. The music plays. Now I perceive the devil understands Welsh, and tis no marvel he is so humorous. By a lady he is a good musician. Then should you be nothing but musical, for you are altogether governed by humours. Lie still, ye thief, and hear the lady sing in Welsh. I had rather hear, lady, my brack howl in Irish. Wouldst thou have thy head broken? No. Then be still. Neither. Tis a woman's fault. Now God help thee. To the Welsh lady's bed. What's that? Ah, peace, she sings. Here the lady sings a Welsh song. Come, Kate, I'll have your song, too. Not mine, in good sooth. Not yours, in good sooth. Heart, you swear like a comfort-maker's wife. Not you, in good sooth. And as true as I live, and as God shall mend me, and uh, as, as sure as day, and give us such sarsenet surety for thy oaths as if you never walked further than Finsbury, Swear me, Kate, like a lady as thou art, a good mouth-filling oath, and leave in sooth, and such protest of pepper gingerbread to velvet guards and Sunday citizens. Come, sing. I will not sing. Tis the next way to turn tailor, or be red-breast teacher, and the indentures be drawn all away within these two hours. And so, come in when ye will. Exit. Come, come, Lord Mortimer. You are as slow as hot Lord Percy is on fire to go. By this our book is drawn. We'll but seal, and then to horse immediately. With all my heart. Exeunt. Scene two. London, the palace. Enter King Henry the Fourth, Prince Henry, and others. Lords, give us leave. The Prince of Wales and I must have some private conference. But be near at hand, for we shall presently have need of you. Exeunt lords. I know not whether God will have it so, for some displeasing service I have done, that in his secret doom out of my blood he'll breed revengement and a scourge for me. But thou dost in thy passages of life make me believe that thou art only marked for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreadings. Tell me else. Could such inordinate and low desires, such poor, such bare, such lewd, such mean attempts, such barren pleasures, rude society, as thou art matched with all and grafted to, accompany the greatness of thy blood, and hold their level with thy princely heart? So please, your majesty, I would I could quit all offences. With this clear excuse, as well I am doubtless I can purge myself, of many I am charged withal. Yet such extenuation let me beg, as, in reproof of many tales devised, which oft the ear of greatness needs must hear by smiling pick thanks and base newsmongers, I may for some things true wherein my youth hath faulty wandered and irregular find pardon on my true submission. God pardon thee! Yet let me wonder, Harry, at thy affections, which do hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ancestors. Thy place and counsel thou hast rudely lost, which by thy younger brother is supplied, and art almost an alien to the hearts of all the court and princes of my blood. The hope and expectation of thy time is ruined, and the soul of every man prophetically doth forethink thy fall. Had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion, that did help me to the crown, had still kept loyal to possession, and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no mark nor likelihood. By being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a comet I was wondered at, that men would tell their children, This is he. Others would say, Where? Where is Bolingbroke? And then I stole all courtesy from heaven, and dressed myself in such humility that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, even in the presence of the crowned king. Thus did I keep my person fresh and new, 
my presence, like a robe pontifical, ne'er seen but wondered at, and so my state, seldom but sumptuous, showed like a feast and won by rareness such solemnity. The skipping king, he ambled up and down with shallow gestures and rash bavin wits, soon kindled and soon burnt, carded his state, mingled his royalty with capering fools, had his great name profaned with their scorns, and gave his countenance, against his name, to laugh at jibing boys and stand the push of every beardless vain comparative, grew a companion to the common streets, enfiffed himself to popularity, that, being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey, and began to loathe the taste of sweetness, whereof a little more than a little is by much too much. So when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo is in June, heard, not regarded, seen, but with such eyes as, sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze, such as is bent on sun-like majesty when it shines seldom in admiring eyes, but rather drowsed and hung their eyelids down, slept in his face, and rendered such aspect as cloudy men use to their adversaries, being with his presence glutted, gorged, and full. And in that very line, Harry, standest thou, for thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. Not an eye but is a-weary of thy common sight, save mine, which hath desired to see thee more, but which now that I would not have it do, make blind itself with foolish tenderness. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself. For all the world, as thou art to this hour, was Richard then, when I from France set foot at Ravensburg, and even as I was then is Percy now. Now, by my sceptre, and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state, than thou the shadow of succession. For of no right, nor colour like to right, he doth fill fields with harness in the realm, turns head against the lion's armoured jaws, and, being no more in debt to years than thou, leads ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and to bruising arms. What never-dying honour hath he got against renowned Douglas, whose high deeds whose hot incursions and great name in arms holds from all soldiers, chief majority, and military title capital through all the kingdoms that acknowledge Christ. Thrice has this Hotspur, Mars in swaddling clothes, this infant warrior, in his enterprises discomfited great Douglas, taken him once, enlarged him and made a friend of him to fill the mouth of deep defiance up, and shake the peace and safety of our throne. What say you to this? Percy, Northumberland, the Archbishop's Grace of York, Douglas, Mortimer, capitulate against us and are up. But wherefore do I tell these news to thee? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes, which art my nearest and dearest enemy? Thou that art like enough, through vassal fear, base inclination, and the start of spleen, to fight against me under Percy's pay, to dog his heels, and curtsy at his frowns, to show how much thou art degenerate. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. And God forgive him that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head and in the closing of some glorious day be bold to tell you that i am your son when i will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favours in a bloody mask which washed away shall scour my shame with it and that shall be the day when e'er it lights that this shame same child of honour and renown this gallant hotspur this all-praised knight, and your unthought of Harry chance to meet, for every honour sitting on his helm would they were multitudes, and on my head my shames were doubled. For the time will come 
that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds from my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf, and I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory up, yea, even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. This in the name of God I promise here, the which, if he be pleased, I shall perform. I do beseech your majesty may salve the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. If not, the end of life cancels all bands, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere I break the smallest parcel of this vow. A hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust herein. Enter Blunt. How now, good Blunt? Thy looks are full of speed. <sighs> so hath the business that I come to speak of. Lord Mortimer of Scotland hath sent word that Douglas and the English rebels met the eleventh of this month at Shrewsbury. A mighty and a fearful head they are, if promises be kept on every hand, as ever offered foul play in the state. The Earl of Westmoreland set forth to-day. With him my son, Lord John of Lancaster, for this advertisement is five days old. On Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward. On Thursday we ourselves will march. Our meeting is bridge north, and, Harry, you shall march through Gloucestershire, by which account our business valued, some twelve days hence our general forces at bridge north shall meet. Our hands are full of business. Let's away. Advantage feeds him fat while men delay. Exeunt. Scene three. Eastcheap, the Boar's Head Tavern. Enter Falstaff and Bardolph. Bardolph, am I not fallen away vilely since this last action? Do I not bait? Do I not dwindle? Why, my skin hangs about me like an old lady's loose gown. I am withered like an old apple, John. Well, I'll repent, and that suddenly. While I am in some liking, I. I shall be out of heart shortly, and then I shall have no strength to repent. And I have not forgotten what the inside of a church is made of. I am a peppercorner, a brewer's horse, the inside of a church. Company, villainous company, hath been the spoil of me. Sir John, you are so fretful, you cannot live long. Why, there is it. Come sing me a bawdy song. Make me merry. I was as virtuously given as a gentleman need to be. Virtuous enough. Swore little. Diced not above seven times a week. Went to a body house once in a quarter of an hour. Paid money that I borrowed three or four times. Lived well and in good compass. And now I live out of all order. Out of all compass. Why, you are so fat, Sir John, that you must needs be out of all compass, out of all reasonable compass, Sir John. Do thou amend thy face, and I'll amend my life. Thou art our admiral. Thou bearest the lantern in the poop, but tis in the nose of thee. Thou art the knight of the burning lamp. Why, Sir John, my face does you no harm? <laughs> no, I'll be sworn. I make as good use of it as many a man doth of a death's head or a memento mori. I never see thy face, but I think upon hell-fire and dives that lived in purple, for there he is in his robes, burning, burning. If thou wert any way given to virtue, I would swear by thy face. My oath should be, by this fire, that's God's angel." But thou art altogether given over, and wert indeed, but for the light in thy face, the son of utter darkness. When thou rannest up Gadsil in the night to catch my horse, if I did not think thou hadst been an ignis fatuus, or a ball of wildfire, there's no purchase in money. Oh, thou art a perpetual triumph, an everlasting bonfire-light, 
Thou hast saved me a thousand marks and links and torches, walking with thee in the night betwixt tavern and tavern. But the sack that thou hast drunk me would have bought me lights as good cheap at the dearest chandlers in Europe. I have maintained that salamander of yours with fire any time this two and thirty years. God reward me for it. Spud, I would my face were in your belly. God a mercy, so should I be sure to be heartburned. Enter hostess. How now? Dame Partlet the hen, have you inquired yet who picked my pocket? Why, Sir John, what do you think, Sir John? Do you think I keep thieves in my house? I have searched, I have inquired, so has my husband. Man by man, boy by boy, servant by servant, the tithe of a hare was never lost in my house before. Ye lie, hostess. Bardolph was shaved and lost many a hair, and I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Go to, you are a woman, go. Who, I? No, I defy thee. God's light, I was never called so in mine own house before. Go to, I know you well enough. No, Sir John, you do not know me, Sir John. I know you, Sir John. You owe me money, Sir John, and now you pick a quarrel to beguile me out of it. I bought you a dozen shirts to your back. Dowless, filthy dowless. I have given them away to bakers' wives, and they have made bolters of them. Now, as I am a true woman, Holland of eight shillings an ell. You owe money here besides, Sir John, for your diet and buy drinkings, and money lent you four and twenty pound. He had his part of it. Let him pay. He? Alas, he is poor. He hath nothing. How? Poor? Look upon his face. What call you rich? Let them coin his nose. Let them coin his cheeks. I'll not pay a denier. What? Will you make a yonker of me? Shall I not take mine case in mine inn, but I shall have my pocket picked? I have lost a seal ring of my grandfather's worth forty mark. Oh, Jesu, I have heard the prince tell him I know not how oft. That ring was copper. How? The prince is a jack, a sneak cup. Splud, and he were here. I would cudgel him like a dog, if he would say so. Enter Prince Henry and Peto, marching, and Falstaff meets them, playing on his truncheon like a fife. How now, lad? Is the wind in that door a faith? Must we all march? Yea, two and two, Newgate fashion. My lord, I pray you, hear me. What sayest thou, mistress, quickly? How doth thy husband? I love him well. He is an honest man. Good my lord, hear me. Prithee, let her alone and list to me. What sayest? Thou, Jack. The other night I fell asleep here behind the arras and had my pocket picked. This house is turned body house. They pick pockets. What didst thou lose, Jack? Wilt thou believe me, Hal? Three or four bonds of forty pound apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather's. A trifle, some eight penny matter. So I told him, my lord, and I said I heard your grace say so. And my lord, he speaks most vilely of you, like a foul-mouthed man as he is, and said he would cudgel you. What? He did not. There's neither faith, truth, nor womanhood in me else. There's no more faith in thee than in a steward prune, nor no more truth in thee than in a drawn fox. And for womanhood, Maid Marian may be the deputy's wife of the war to thee. Go, you thing, go. Say, what thing, what thing? What thing? Why, a thing to thank God on. I am no thing to thank God on, I would thou shouldst know it. I am an honest man's wife, and setting thy knighthood aside, thou art a knave to call me so. Setting thy womanhood aside, thou art a beast to say otherwise. Say, what beast, thou knave, thou? What beast? Why, an otter. An otter, Sir John? Why an otter? Why, she's neither fish nor flesh. A man knows not where to have her. Thou art an unjust man in saying so. Thou or any man knows where to have me, thou knave, thou. Thou sayest true, hostess, and he slanders thee most grossly. So he doth you, my lord, and said this other day you ought him a thousand pound. Sirrah, do I owe you a thousand pound? <laughs> a thousand pound? Ha! Ah, a million! Thy love is worth a million! Thou owest me thy love. Nay, my lord, he called you Jack, and said he would cudgel you. Did I, Bardolph? Indeed, Sir John, you said so. Yea, if he said my ring was copper. I say tis copper. Darest thou be as good as thy word now? Why, how? 
thou knowest as thou art but man i dare but as thou art prince i fear thee as i fear the roaring of a lion's whelp and why not as the lion the king is to be feared as the lion dost thou think i'll fear thee as i fear thy father nay an i do i pray god my good will break oh if it should how would thy guts fall about thy knees but sirrah there's no room for faith truth nor honesty in this bosom of thine it is all filled up with guts and midriff charge an honest woman with picking thy pocket why thou horse son impudent embossed rascal if there were anything in thy pocket but tavern reckonings memorandums of body houses and one poor pennyworth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded if thy pocket were enriched with any other injuries but these i am a villain and yet you will stand to it you will not pocket up wrong art thou not ashamed dost thou hear how thou knowest in the state of innocency adam fell and what should poor jack falstaff do in the days of villainy thou seest i have more flesh than another man and therefore more frailty you confess then you picked my pocket it appears so by the story hostess i forgive thee go make ready breakfast love thy husband look to thy servants cherish thy guests thou shalt find me tractable to any honest reason thou seest i am pacified still nay prithee be gone exit hostess now hal to the news at court for the robbery lad how is that answered oh my sweet beef i must still be good angel to thee the money is paid back again oh i do not like that paying back tis a double labour i am good friends with my father and may do anything rob me the exchequer the first thing thou doest and do it with unwashed hands too do my lord i have procured thee jack a charge of foot i would it had been of horse where shall i find one that can steal well oh for a fine thief of the age of two and twenty or thereabouts i am heinously unprovided well god be thanked for these rebels they offend none but the virtuous i laud them i praise them bardolph my lord go bear this letter to lord john of lancaster to my brother john this to my lord of westmoreland exit bardolph go pito to horse to horse for thou and i have thirty miles to ride yet ere dinner time exit pito jack meet me to-morrow in the temple hall at two o'clock in the afternoon there thou shalt know thy charge and there receive money and order for their furniture the land is burning percy stands on high and either they or we must lower lie exit prince henry rare words brave world hostess my breakfast come oh i could wish this tavern were my drum exit end of act three Act Four of Henry the Fourth, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry the Fourth, Part One by William Shakespeare. Act Four. Scene One The Rebel Camp near Shrewsbury. Enter Hotspur, Worcester, and Douglas. Well said, my noble Scot. If speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattery, such attribution should the Douglas have, as not a soldier of this season's stamp should go so general current through the world. Not by God, I cannot flatter. I do defy the tongues of soothers, but a braver place in my heart's love hath no man than yourself. Nay, task me to my word, prove me, Lord. Thou art the king of honour. No man so potent breathes upon the ground, but I will beard him. Do so, 
And tis well. Enter a messenger with letters. What letters hast thou there? I can but thank you. These letters come from your father. Letters from him? Why comes he not himself? He cannot come, my lord. He is grievous sick. Sounds. How is he the leisure to be sick in such a rustling time? Who leads his power? Under whose government come they along? His letters bear his mind, not I, my lord. I prithee tell me, does he keep his bed? He did, my lord, four days ere I set forth, and at the time of my departure thence he was much feared by his physicians. I would the state of time had first been whole ere he by sickness had been visited. His health was never better worth than now. Sick now? Troop now? This sickness doth infect the very life-blood of our enterprise. Tis catching hither, even to our camp. He writes me here, that inward sickness, and that his friends by deputation could not so soon be drawn, nor did he think it meet to lay so dangerous and dear a trust on any soul removed but on his own. Yet doth he give us bold advertisement, that with our small conjunction we should on to see how fortune is disposed to us. For, as he writes, there is no quailing now, because the king is certainly possessed of all our purposes. What say you to it? Your father's sickness is a maim to us. A perilous gash, a very limb lopped off. And yet, in faith, it is not. His present want seems more than we shall find it. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast? To set so rich a main on the nice hazard of one doubtful hour? It were not good. For therein should we read the very bottom and the soul of hope, the very list, the very utmost bound of all our fortunes. Faith, and so we should, where now remains a sweet reversion, we may boldly spend upon the hope of what is to come in. A comfort of retirement lives in this. A rendezvous, a home to fly unto, if that the devil and mischance look big upon the maidenhead of our affairs. But yet I would your father had been here. The quality and hair of our attempt brooks no division. It will be thought by some that know not why he's away, that wisdom, loyalty, or mere dislike of our proceedings kept the earl from hence. And think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction, and breed a kind of question in our cause. For, well you know, we of the offering side must keep aloof from strict arbitrament, and stop all sight-holes, every loop from whence the eye of reason may pry in upon us. This absence of your father's draws a curtain that shows the ignorant a kind of fear before not dreamt of. You strain too far. I rather of his absence make this use. It lends a lustre and more great opinion a larger dare to our great enterprise than if the earl were here. For men must think, if we without his help can make a head to push against a kingdom, with his help we shall o'erturn it topsy-turvy down. Yet all goes well, yet all our joints are whole. As heart can think, there is not such a word spoke of in Scotland as this term of fear. Enter Sir Richard Vernon. My cousin Vernon, welcome by my soul. Pray God my news be worth a welcome, Lord. The Earl of Westmoreland, seven thousand strong, is marching hitherwards, with him Prince John. No harm. What more? And further I have learned the King himself in person is set forth, or hitherwards intended speedily, with strong and mighty preparation. He shall be welcome too. Where is his son, that nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales, and his comrades? that daft the world aside and bid it pass. All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estridges that with the wind baited like eagles having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats like images, as full of spirit as the month of May, and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer, wanton as youthful goats, wild as young bulls. I saw young Harry with his beaver on, his cusses on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like a feathered mercury, and vaulted with such ease into his seat, as if an angel dropped down from the clouds, to turn and win the fiery Pegasus, and witch the world with noble horsemanship. No more, no more, worse than the sun in March this praise doth nourish agues. 
Let them come, they come like sacrifices in their trim. And to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war, all hot and bleeding, will we offer them. The mailed Mars shall on his altar sit up to the ears in blood. I am on fire to hear this rich reprisal is so nigh, and yet not ours. Come, let me taste my horse, who is to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales. Harry to Harry shall, hot horse to horse, meet and never part till one drop down a course. Oh, that Glendower were come! There is more news. I learned in Worcester as I rode along. He cannot draw his power this fourteen days. That's the worst tidings that I hear of yet. Ay, by my faith, that bears a frosty sound. What may the king's whole battle reach unto? To thirty thousand. Ah, forty let it be. My father and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let us take a muster speedily. Doomsday is near. Die all. Die merrily. Talk not of dying. I am out of fear of death or death's hand for this one half year. Exeunt. Scene two. A public road near Coventry. Enter Falstaff and Bardolph. Bardolph, get thee before to Coventry. Fill me a bottle of sack. Our soldiers shall march through. We'll to Sutton Cofield to-night. Will you give me money, Captain? Lay out, lay out. This bottle makes an angel. And if it do, take it for thy labor. And if it make twenty, take them all. I'll answer the coinage. Bid my lieutenant Pito meet me at town's end. I will, Captain. Farewell. Exit. If I be not ashamed of my soldiers, I am a soused garnet. I have misused the king's press damnably. I have got, in exchange of a hundred and fifty soldiers, three hundred and odd pounds. I press me none but good householders, yeoman's sons. Inquire me out contracted bachelors such as had been asked twice on the bands. Such a commodity of warm slaves as had as leave hear the devil as a drum, such as fear the report of a caliver worse than a struck fowl or a hurt wild duck. I pressed me none but such toasts and butter, with hearts in their bellies no bigger than pins' heads, and they have bought out their services. And now my whole charge consists of ancients, corporals, lieutenants, gentlemen of companies, slaves as ragged as Lazarus in the painted cloth, where the glutton's dogs licked his sores, and such as indeed were never soldiers, but discarded unjust serving men, younger sons to younger brothers, revolted tapsters and ostlers trade-fallen, the cankers of a calm world and a long peace, ten times more dishonorable ragged than an old-faced ancient, and such have I to fill up the rooms of them that have bought out their services, that you would think that I had a hundred and fifty tattered prodigals lately come from swine-keeping, from eating draff and husks. A mad fellow met me on the way and told me I had unloaded all the gibbets and pressed the dead bodies. No I have seen such scarecrows. I'll not march through Coventry with them, that's flat. Nay, and the villains march wide betwixt the legs, as if they had jives on, for indeed I had the most of them out of prison. There's but a shirt and a half in all my company, and the half-shirt is two napkins tacked together, and thrown over the shoulders like an herald's coat without sleeves, and the shirt to say the truth, stolen from my host at St. Albans, or the red-nosed innkeeper of Daventry. But that's all one. They'll find linen enough on every hedge. Enter the Prince and Westmoreland. How now, blown Jack? How now, Quilt? What how? How now, Madwag? What a devil dost thou in Warwickshire? My good lord of Westmoreland, I cry you mercy. I thought your honour had already been at Shrewsbury. Faith, Sir John, tis more than time that I were there, and you too, but my powers are there already. The king, I can tell you, looks for us all. We must away all night. But never fear me. I am as vigilant as a cat to steal cream. I think to steal cream indeed, for thy theft hath already made thee butter. But tell me, Jack, 
Whose fellows are these that come after? Mine, Hal, mine. I did never see such pitiful rascals. Tut, tut, good enough to toss. Food for powder, food for powder. They'll fill a pit as well as better. Tush, man, mortal men, mortal men. Ay, but, Sir John, methinks they are exceedingly poor, and bare, too beggarly. Faith, for their poverty, I know not where they had that, and for their bareness, I am sure they never learned that of me. No, I'll be sworn, unless you call three fingers on the ribs bare. But, sirrah, make haste. Percy is already in the field. What? Is the king encamped? He is, Sir John. I fear we shall stay too long. Well, to the latter end of a fray and the beginning of a feast, fits a dull fighter and a keen guest. Excellent. Scene three. The rebel camp near Shrewsbury. Enter Hotspur, Worcester, Douglas, and Vernon. We'll fight with him tonight. It may not be. You give him, then, the advantage. Not a whit. Why say you so? Looks he not for supply? So do we. His is certain, ours is doubtful. Good cousin, be advised, stir not to-night. Do not, my lord. You do not counsel well. You speak it out of fear and cold heart. Do me no slander, Douglas, by my life, and I dare well maintain it with my life. If well-respected honour bid me on, I hold as little counsel with weak fear, as you, my lord, or any Scot that this day lives. Let it be seen to-morrow in the battle which of us fears. Yea, or to-night. Content. To-night, say I. Come, come, it may not be. I wonder much, being men of such great leading as you are, that you foresee not what impediments drag back our expedition. Certain horse of my cousin Vernon's are not yet come up. Your uncle Worcester's horse only came but to-day, and now their pride and mettle is asleep, their courage with hard labour tame and dull, that not a horse is half the half of himself. So are the horses of the enemy in general, journey baited and brought low. The better part of ours are full of rest. The number of the king exceedeth ours. For God's sake, cousins, stay till all come in. The trumpet sounds a parley. Enter Sir Walter Blunt. I come with gracious offers from the king, if you vouchsafe me hearing and respect. Welcome, Sir Walter Blunt, and would to God you were of our determination. Some of us love you well, and even though some envy your great deservings and good name, because you are not of our quality but stand against us like an enemy. And God defend, but still I should stand so, so long as out of limit and true rule you stand against anointed majesty. But to my charge, the king hath sent to know the nature of your griefs, and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching as duteous land audacious cruelty. If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which he confesseth to be manifold, he bids you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desires with interest, and pardon absolute for yourself, and these herein misled by your suggestion. The king is kind, and well we know the king knows at what time to promise, when to pay. My father and my uncle and myself did give him that same royalty he wears, and when he was not six and twenty strong, sick in the world's regard, wretched and low, the poor unminded outlaw sneaking home, my father gave him welcome to the shore, and when he heard him swear and vow to God he came but to be Duke of Lancaster, to sue his livery and beg his peace, tears of innocency and terms of zeal, my father, in kind heart and pity moved, swore him assistance, and performed it too. Now when the lords and barons of the realm perceived Northumberland did lean to him, though more and less came in with cap and knee, met him in boroughs, cities, villages, attended him on bridges, stood in lanes, laid gifts before him, proffered him their oaths, gave him their heirs, as pages followed him, even at the heels in golden multitudes. He presently, as greatness knows itself, steps me a little higher than his vow made to my father, while his blood was poor, upon the naked shore at Ravensperg. 
and now forsooth takes on him to reform some certain edicts and some straight decrees that lie too heavy on the commonwealth cries out upon abuses seems to weep over his country's wrongs and by this face this seeming brow of justice did he win the hearts of all that he did angle for proceeded further cut me off the heads of all the favourites that the absent king in deputation left behind him here when he was personal in the irish war tut i came not to hear this then to the point in short time after he deposed the king soon after that deprived him of his life and in the neck of that tasked the whole state to make that worse suffered his kinsman march who is if every owner were well placed indeed his king to be engaged in wales there without ransom to lie forfeited, disgraced me in my happy victories, sought to entrap me by intelligence, raided mine uncle from the council board, in rage dismissed my father from the court, broke oath on oath, committed wrong on wrong, and in conclusion drove us to seek out this head of safety, and withal to pry into his title, the which we find too indirect for long continuance. Shall I return this answer to the king? Not so, Sir Walter. We'll withdraw a while. Go to the king, and let there be impawned some surety for a safe return again, and in the morning early shall my uncle bring him our purposes. And so farewell. I would you would accept of grace and love. And maybe so we shall. Pray God you do. Exeunt. Scene 4. York, the Archbishop's Palace. Enter the Archbishop of York and Sir Michael. Hi, good Sir Michael, bear this sealed brief with winged haste to the Lord Marshal, this to my cousin Scroop, and all the rest to whom they are directed. If you knew how much they do to import, you would make haste. My good Lord, I guess their tenor. Like enough you do. Tomorrow, good Sir Michael, is a day wherein the fortune of ten thousand men must bide the touch, for Sir, at Shrewsbury, as I am truly given to understand, the king with mighty and quick raised power meets with Lord Harry, and I fear, Sir Michael, what with the sickness of Northumberland, whose power was in the first proportion, and what with Owen Glendower's absence thence, who with them was a rated sinew too, and comes not in, or ruled by prophecies, I fear the power of Percy is too weak to wage an instant trial with the king." why my good lord you need not fear there is douglas and lord mortimer no mortimer is not there but there is mordake vernon lord harry percy and there is my lord of worcester and a head of gallant warriors noble gentlemen and so there is but yet the king hath drawn the special head of all the land together the prince of wales lord john of lancaster the noble westmoreland and warlike blunt and more co-rivals and dear men of estimation and command in arms doubt not my lord they shall be well opposed i hope no less yet needful tis to fear and to prevent the worst sir michael speed for if lord percy thrive not ere the king dismiss his power he means to visit us for he hath heard of our confederacy and tis but wisdom to make strong against him therefore make haste i must go right again to other friends and so farewell sir michael Excellent. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Henry the Fourth, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Henry the Fourth, Part 1 By William Shakespeare Act Five, Scene One, King Henry the Fourth's camp near Shrewsbury. Enter King Henry, Prince Henry, Lord John of Lancaster, Earl of Westmoreland, Sir Walter Blunt, and Falstaff. How bloodily the sun begins to peer above yon busky hill! The day looks pale at his distemperature. The southern wind doth play the trumpet to his purposes and by his hollow whistling in the leaves foretells a tempest and a blustering day then with the losers let it sympathize for nothing can seem foul to those that win the trumpet sounds enter worcester and vernon 
How now, my lord of Worcester? Tis not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we meet. You have deceived our trust, and made us doff our easy robes of peace, to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord, this is not well. What say you to it? Will you again unknit this curlish knot of all abhorred war, and move in that obedient orb again where you did give a fair and natural light, and be no more an exhaled meteor, a prodigy of fear, and a portent of broached mischief to the unborn times? Hear me, my liege. For mine own part I could be well content to entertain the lag-end of life with quiet hours, for I protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it. How comes it, then? Rebellion lay in his way, and he found it. Peace, Chewett, peace. It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favour from myself and all our house. And yet I must remember you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. For you my staff of office did I break in Richard's time, and posted day and night to meet you on the way and kiss your hand, when yet you were in place and in account nothing so strong and fortunate as I. It was myself, my brother and his son, that brought you home, and boldly did outdare the dangers of the time. You swore to us, and you did swear that oath at Doncaster, that you did nothing purpose gainst the state, nor claim no further than your new fallen right, the seat of Gaunt, dukedom of Lancaster. To this we swore our aid, but in short space it rained down fortune showering on your head, and such a flood of greatness fell on you, what with our help, what with the absent king, what with the injuries of a wanton time, the seeming sufferances that you'd borne, and the contrarious winds that held the king so long in his unlucky Irish wars, that all in England did repute him dead. And from this swarm of fair advantages you took occasion to be quickly wooed, to grip the general sway into your hand, forgot your oath to us at Doncaster, and being fed by us, you used us so as that ungentle gull the cuckoo's bird useth the sparrow, did oppress our nest, grew by our feeding to so great a bulk that even our love durst not come near your sight for fear of swallowing. But with nimble wing we were enforced for safety's sake to fly out of your sight, and raise this present head whereby we stand opposed, by such means as you yourself have forged against yourself, by unkind usage, dangerous countenance, and violation of all faith and troth sworn to us in your younger enterprise. These things indeed you have articulate, proclaimed at market-crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion with some fine colour that may please the eye of fickle changelings and poor discontents, which gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly-burly innovation, and never yet did insurrection want such water-colours to impaint his cause, nor moody beggars starving for a time of pell-mell havoc and confusion. In both our armies there is many a soul shall pay full dearly for this encounter if once they join in trial. Tell your nephew, the Prince of Wales, just join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. By my hopes, this present enterprise set off his head. I do not think a braver gentleman, more active valiant or more valiant young, more daring or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. For my part, I may speak it to my shame, I have a truant been to, tr to chivalry, and so I hear he doth account me too. Yet this before my father's majesty, I am content that he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation and will, to save the blood on either side, try fortune with him in single fight. And, Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee albeit considerations infinite do make against it. No, good Worcester, no, we love our people well. 
even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. And will they take the offer of our grace? Both he, and they, and you, every man shall be my friend again, and I'll be his. So tell your cousin, and bring me word what he will do. But if he will not yield, rebuke and dread correction wait on us, and they shall do their office. So be gone. We will not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair. Take it advisedly. Exeunt Worcester and Vernon. It will not be accepted on my life. The Douglas and the Hotspur, both together, are confident against the world in arms. Hence, therefore, every leader to his charge. For on their answer will we set on them and God befriend us, as our cause is just. Exeunt all but Prince Henry and Falstaff. Hal, if thou see me down in the battle, and bestride me so, uh, tis a point of friendship. Nothing but a colossus can do thee that friendship. Say thy prayers, and farewell. I would twere bedtime, Hal, and all well. Why, thou owest God a death. Exit Prince Henry. It is not due yet. I would be loath to pay him before his day. What need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Well, it is no matter. Honour pricks on me. Yea, but how if honour prick me off when I come on? How then? Can honour set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honour hath no skill in surgery, then? No. What is honour? A word. What is in that word, honour? What is that honour? Air. A trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible, then, yea, to the dead. But will it not live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it, therefore I'll none of it. Honour is a mere scutcheon. And so ends my catechism. Exit. Scene two. The Rebel Camp. Enter Worcester and Vernon. Oh, no, my nephew must not know, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king. T'were best he did. Then are we all undone. It is not possible, it cannot be, the king should keep his word in loving us. He will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offence in other faults. Supposition all our lives shall be stuck full of eyes, for treason is but trusted like the fox who, never so tame, so cherished, and locked up, will have a wild trick of his ancestors. Look how we can, or sadly or merrily, interpretation will misquote our looks, and we shall feed like oxen at a stall, the better cherished still the nearer death. My nephew's trespass may be well forgot. It hath the excuse of youth and heat of blood, and an adopted name of privilege a hair-brained hotspur governed by a spleen. All his offences live upon my head and on his father's. We did train him on, and his corruption being ta'en from us, we as the spring of all shall pay for all. Therefore, good cousin, let not Harry know in any case the offer of the king. Deliver what you will. I'll say tis so. Here comes your cousin. Enter Hotspur and Douglas. My uncle is returned. Deliver up, my lord of Westmoreland. Uncle, what news? The king will bid you battle presently. Defy him by the lord of Westmoreland. Lord Douglas, go you and tell him so. Marry and shall, and very willingly. Exit. There is no seeming mercy in the king. Did you beg any? God forbid. I told him gently of our grievances, of his oath-breaking, which he mended thus, by now forswearing that he is forsworn. He calls us rebels, traitors, 
and will scourge with haughty arms this hateful name in us. Re-enter the Earl of Douglas. Arm, gentlemen, to arms, for I have thrown a brave defiance in King Henry's teeth, and Westmoreland that was engaged did bear it, that cannot choose but bring him quickly on. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the King, and, nephew, challenged you to single fight. Oh, would the quarrel lay upon our heads, and that no man might draw a short breath to-day but I and Harry Monmouth. Tell me, tell me, how showed his tasking, seemed it in contempt? No, by my soul, I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly, unless a brother should a brother dare, to gentle exercise and proof of arms, he gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue, spoke to your deservings like a chronicle, making you ever better than his praise, by still dispraising praise valued in you, and, which became you like a prince indeed, he made a blushing sight of himself, and child his truant youth with such grace as if he mastered there a double spirit, of teaching and learning instantly. There did he pause, but let me tell the world, if he outlived the envy of this day, England did never owe so sweet a hope, so much misconstrued in his wantonness. Cousin, I think thou art enamoured on his follies. Never did I hear of any prince so wild a libertine. But be he as he will, yet once, ere night, I will embrace him with a soldier's arm, that he shall shrink under my courtesy. Arm, arm with speed, and fellows, soldiers, friends, better consider what you have to do than I, that have not well the gift of tongue, can lift your blood up with persuasion. Enter a messenger. My lord, here are letters for you. I cannot read them now. O oh, gentlemen, the time of life is short. To spend that shortness basely were too long. If life did ride upon a dial's point, still ending at the arrival of an hour, and if we live, we live to tread on kings, if die, brave death, when princes die with us. Now for our consciences the arms are fair, when the intent of bearing them is just. Enter another messenger. My lord, prepare, the king comes on apace. I thank him that he cuts me from my tale, for I profess not talking, only this, let each man do his best, and here draw I a sword, whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all, in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance, Percy, and set on, sound all the lofty instruments of war, and by that music let us all embrace, for heaven to earth some of us shall never a second time do such a courtesy. The trumpets sound. They embrace and exunt. Scene three, plain between the camps. King Henry enters with his power. Alarum to the battle. Then enter Douglas and Sir Walter Blunt. What is thy name that in the battle thus thou crossest me? What honour dost thou seek upon my head? Know then my name is Douglas, and I do haunt thee in the battle thus, because some tell me that thou art a king. They tell thee true. The Lord of Stafford dear to-day hath bought thy likeness, for instead of thee, King Harry, this sword hath ended him. So shall it thee, unless thou yield thee as my prisoner. I was not born a yielder, thou proud Scot, and thou shalt find a king that will revenge Lord Stafford's death. They fight. Douglas kills Sir Walter Blunt. Enter Hotspur. O oh, Douglas, hadst thou fought at Holmden thus, never had triumphed upon a Scot. All's done, all's won. Here breathless lies the king. Where? Here. This, Douglas? No. I know this face full well. A gallant knight he was. His name was Blunt. Semblably furnished like the king himself. A fool go with thy soul, whither it goes. A borrowed title hath thou bought too dear. Why didst thou tell me thou wert a king? The king hath many marching in his coats. Now by my sword I will kill all his coats. I'll murder all his wardrobe, piece by piece, until I meet the king. Up and away. Our soldiers stand full fairly for the day. Exunt. Alarum. Enter Falstaff, Solus. Though I could scape shot free at London, I fear the shot here. 
Here's no scoring but upon the pate. Soft! Who are you? Sir Walter Blunt, there's honour for you. Here's no vanity. I am as hot as molten lead, and as heavy, too. Oh, God, keep lead out of me. I need no more weight than mine own bowels. I have led my ragamuffins where they are peppered. There's not three of my hundred and fifty left alive, and they are for the town's end to beg during life. But who comes here? Enter Prince Henry. What? Standest thou idle here? Lend me thy sword. Many a nobleman lies stark and stiff under the hoofs of vaunting enemies, whose deaths are yet unrevenged. I prithee, lend me thy sword. Oh, Hal, I prithee, give me leave to breathe a while. Turk Gregory never did such deeds in arms as I have done this day. I have paid Percy. I have made him sure. He is indeed, and living to kill thee. I prithee, lend me thy sword. Nay, before God, Hal, if Percy be alive, thou gettest not my sword. But take my pistol, if thou wilt. Give it me. What, is it in the case? Eh, hey, Hal, tis hot, tis hot. There's that will sack a city. Prince Henry draws it out and finds it to be a bottle of sack. What? Is it a time to jest and dally now? He throws the bottle at him. Exit. Well, if Percy be alive, I'll pierce him. If he do come in my way, so. If he do not, if I come in his willingly, let him make a carbonado of me. I like not such grinning honour as a Sir Walter hath. Give me life, which I can save so. If not, honour comes and look for and there's an end. Exit Falstaff. Scene four. Another part of the field. Alarum. Excursions. Enter Prince Henry, Lord John of Lancaster, and Earl of Westmoreland. I prithee, Harry, withdraw thyself. Thou bleedest too much. Lord John of Lancaster, go you with him. Not I, my lord, unless I did bleed too. I do beseech your majesty, make up. Uh, lest your retirement do amaze your friends. I will do so. My lord of Westmoreland, lead him to his tent. Come, my lord, I'll lead you to your tent. Lead me, my lord? I do not need your help, and God forbid a shallow scratch should drive the Prince of Wales from such a field as this, where stained nobility lies trodden on, and rebels' arms triumph in massacres. We breathe too long. Come, cousin Westmoreland, our duty this way lies. For God's sake, come. Exeunt Lancaster and Westmoreland. By God, thou hast deceived me, Lancaster. I did not think thee lord of such a spirit. Before I loved thee as a brother, John. But now I do respect thee as my soul. I saw him hold Lord Percy to the point with lustier maintenance than I did look for of such an ungrown warrior. Oh, this boy lends metal to us all. Exit. Enter Douglas. Another king. They grow like Hydra's heads. I am the Douglas, fatal to all those who wear those colors on them. What art thou that counterfeitest the person of a king? The king himself. Who, Douglas, grieves at heart so many of his shadows thou hast met, and not the very king? I have two boys seek Percy and thyself about the field, but, seeing that thou fallest on me so luckily, I will assay thee. So, defend thyself. I fear thou art another counterfeit, and yet in faith thou bearest thee like a king, but mine I am sure thou art, whoever thou be, and thus I win thee. They fight. King Henry being in danger, Prince Henry enters. Hold up thy head, vile Scot, or thou art like never to hold up again. The spirits of valiant Shirley, Stafford, Blunt are in my arms. It is the Prince of Wales that threatens thee, who never promiseth but he means to pay. They fight. 
Douglas flies. Cheerily, my lord, how fares your grace? Sir Nicholas Gazi hath for succor sent, and so hath Clifton. I'll go to Clifton straight. Stay and breathe a while. Thou hast redeemed thy lost opinion, and showed thou makest some tender of my life in this fair rescue thou hast brought to me. O oh God, they did me too much injury that ever said I hearkened for your death. If it were so, I might have let alone the insulting hand of Douglas over you, which would have been as speedy in your end as all the poisonous potions in the world, and save the treacherous labor of your son. Make up to Clifton. I'll to Sir Nicholas Gauzy. Exit. Enter Hotspur. If I mistake not, thou art Harry Monmouth. Thou speakest as if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Why, then I see a very valiant rebel of the name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not, Percy, to share with me in glory any more. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour is come to end the one of us, and would to God thy name and arms were now as great as mine. I'll make it greater, ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors on thy crest I'll crop, to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanities. They fight. Enter Falstaff. Well said, Hal. To it, Hal. Nay. You shall find no boys play here, I can tell you. Re-enter Douglas. He fights with Falstaff, who falls down as if he were dead, and exit Douglas. Hotspur is wounded and falls. O oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than sword my flesh. But thought's the slave of life, and lifetime's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. Oh, I could prophesy, but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust, and food for— Dies. For worms, brave Percy. Fare thee well, great heart, ill-weaved ambition. How much art thou shrunk, when that this body did contain a spirit? A kingdom for it was too small a bound. But now, two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead, bears not alive so stout a gentleman. If thou wert sensible out of courtesy, I should not make so dear a show of zeal. But let my favors hide thy mangled face. And even in thy behalf, I'll thank myself for doing these fair rites of tenderness. Adieu, and take thy praise with thee to heaven. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in thy grave, but not remember it in thy epitaph. He spieth Falstaff on the ground. What, old acquaintance? Could not all this flesh keep in a little life? Poor Jack, farewell. I could have better spared a better man. Oh, I should have a heavy miss of thee if I were much in love with vanity. Death hath not struck so fat a deer today, though many dearer. In this bloody fray. Embowled will I see thee by and by. Till then in blood. Thy noble Percy lie. Exit Prince Henry. Embowled? If thou embowel me today, I'll give you leave to powder me and eat me too tomorrow. It's blood, twas time to counterfeit, or that hot term against Scott had paid me Scott and Lot too. Counterfeit? I lie. I am no counterfeit. 
to die is to be a counterfeit for he is but the counterfeit of a man who hath not the life of a man but to counterfeit dying when a man thereby liveth is to be no counterfeit but the true and perfect image of life indeed the better part of valour is discretion in the which better part i have saved my life zounds i am afraid of this gunpowder percy though he be dead now if he should counterfeit too and rise by my faith i am afraid he would prove the better counterfeit therefore i'll make him sure yea and i'll swear i killed him why may not he rise as well as i nothing confutes me but eyes and nobody sees me therefore sirrah stabbing him with a new wound in your thigh come you along with me takes up hotspur on his back re-enter prince henry and lord john of lancaster come brother john full bravely hast thou fleshed thy maiden sword but soft whom have we here did you not tell me that this fat man was dead i did i saw him dead breathless and bleeding on the ground art thou alive or is it fantasy that pleads upon our eyesight i pray thee speak we will not trust our eyes without our ears thou art not what thou seemst no that's certain i am not a double man but if i be not jack falstaff then am i a jack there is percy throwing the body down if your father will do me any honour so if not let him kill the next percy himself i look to be either earl or duke i can assure you why percy i killed myself and saw thee dead <laughs> didst thou lord lord how this world is given to lying i i grant you i was down and out of breath and so was he but we rose both at an instant and, and fought a long hour by shrewsbury clock if i may be believed so if not let them that should reward valour bear the sin upon their own heads i'll take it upon my death i gave him this wound in the thigh if the man were alive and would deny it sounds i would make him eat a piece of my sword this is the strangest tale that ever i heard <laughs> this is the strangest fellow brother john come bring your luggage nobly on your back for my part if a lie may do thee grace i'll gild it with the happiest terms i have a retreat is sounded the trumpet sounds retreat the day is ours come brother let's to the highest of the field and see what friends are living and who are dead exeunt prince henry and lancaster i'll follow as they say for reward he that rewards me god reward him if i do grow great i'll grow less for i'll purge and leave sack and live cleanly as a nobleman should do exit scene five another part of the field the trumpets sound enter king henry the fourth prince henry lord john lancaster Earl of Westmoreland, with Worcester and Vernon prisoners. Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Ill-spirited Worcester, did not we send grace, pardon, and terms of love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our offers contrary? Misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust? Three knights upon our party slain to-day, a noble earl and many a creature else had been alive this hour, if, like a Christian, thou hadst truly borne betwixt our armies true intelligence what i have done my safety urged me to and i embrace this fortune patiently since not to be avoided it falls on me bear worcester to the death and vernon too other offenders we will pause upon exeunt worcester and vernon guarded how goes the field the noble scot lord douglas when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble Percy slain and all his men upon the foot of fear, fled with the rest. And falling from a hill, he was so bruised that the pursuers took him. At my tent, 
the Douglas is. And I beseech your grace I may dispose of him. With all my heart. Then, brother John of Lancaster, to you this honorable bounty shall belong. Go to the Douglas and deliver him up to his pleasure ransomless and free. His valor shown upon our crests today hath taught us how to cherish such high deeds, even in the bosom of our adversaries. I thank your grace for this high courtesy, which I shall give away immediately. Then this remains, that we divide our power. You, son John, and my cousin Westmoreland, towards York shall bend you with your dearest speed, to meet Northumberland and the prelate Scroop, who as we hear are busily in arms. Myself and you, son Harry, will towards Wales, to fight with Glendower and the Earl of March. Rebellion in this land shall lose his sway, meeting the check of such another day. And since this business so fair is done, let us not leave till all our own be won. Exeunt. End of Act Five. End of Henry the Fourth, Part One, by William Shakespeare.